down. I welcome everybody to the meeting. Let's call the May 10th, 2018 Planning Commission meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody to our new location. We're going to hold meetings here from here on out. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding. We um, so early voting is taking place uh, at our normal meeting. Um, this was the last um, event type space that we could get. So I apologize for parking and uh, being here, but this was the last space that we could we could find. So. Um, also, uh, I do want to tell y'all that tonight um, there's something big going on in Nashville, Tennessee. So at 7.10, we need to be finished. Um, and I do say that, but um, there's a little bit of uh, a lot of us and a lot of the commissioners have tickets and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> But it is a public meeting. You're here and um, you have the ability to speak. Um, but short speaking is better, I think, tonight. Anyway, uh, with that said, we'll go right to the agenda, and so we'll need a motion to the, adopt the agenda. Commissioners, have you all looked at that? So and so, there's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on the agenda? All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and this agenda is adopted. Now we're on item C, which is the approval of the April 26, 2018 minutes as have the commissioners reviewed the minutes? Any questions? We'll need a motion. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on approving the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those minutes are adopted. Now we're on to item D, which is the recognition of the council members. And I wrote these down as we saw the council members come in. So first we had Councilman Swope. Are you? I saw. Do you want to? Come on up. Yeah, I promise you I'll be one minute or less. Come on up. I have tickets too. <laughs> Ding. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Council, uh, <laughs> commissioners, thank you for your time uh, and your service to the city. Uh, it is greatly appreciated, especially under the conditions that we're all having to live under. Uh, I'm here to speak about the Brian Paul Hotel. I think it's 15A and 15B on consent tonight. Unless anybody here wants to speak against it? No, still on consent. Um, I've spent two and a half years working on this project. Uh, it is world class, iconic, very expensive. It's a $300 million project um, on the one hill, the last hill in Davidson County before you get into our neighbors in Williamson. And I think what the developers have proposed will make that hill an iconic landmark for the hundred, next 100 years. It's very European looking. I think it fits in very well with the Brentwood culture, feel, scheme. Um, we've had uh, several meetings on this, one big community meeting and a couple much, two much smaller meetings with the board of directors of the HOAs for the two adjoining communities. And so far, no one has had any, had any real problem with it. There's been some adjustments on where the road is going to be on the top side of the hill that we are still working with those neighbors on, and we will continue to work on it. And you have my word that until the Brentwood Villas is satisfied with all this, it will not pass through third reading in council. But I do ask for your approval tonight, and I think I'm at one minute right now. And with that said, go Preds. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. We really appreciate it. Councilman Hager, you want to go now? Come on up. I'll wait till we get to, I've got uh, 2018 SP041001, I'll wait till we get, because it's off consent. And uh, when we get to that, I'll come up and speak. Thank you, Councilman. Which Thank number you. is it? Um, Page nine, top. Number 19. Okay. Thank you, Thank Councilman. You. Council Lady Kathleen Murphy, I saw. I'll speak at our case. Thank you, Council Lady. Good to see you. Councilman Colby Sledge, I saw Colby. Okay, did I miss any council members? I wanna make sure. All right, good deal. So now we're on to item E, items for deferral withdrawal. The items for deferral or withdrawal are as follows. Item number one on page five of your agenda, 2018M, 001OT, 001, the Donaldson Transit Oriented Redevelopment Plan. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. 
Item number three, uh, 2015 SP 049003, 1225 Stainback Avenue Amendment. The staff recommendation is to defer to the June 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number five, 2018 SP 017001 on page six of your agenda. The Glendale and Scenic SP staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2017 NHL 002002, the Bel Air Mansion Neighborhood Landmark Development Plan. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note that Chairman Adkins is recusing himself from that item. Item number seven, 2018S059001, 1020 East Old Hickory Boulevard Concept Plan. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item number eight, 2018Z044PR001. It's a request to rezone from R8 to RM20A. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 13 on page seven of your agenda, 2018SP033001. 2423 Buena Vista Pike SP staff recommendation is to defer to May 24th planning commission meeting. Item number 14, 2018 SP 034001. The Tusculum Road SP staff recommendation is to defer to May 24th planning commission meeting. Item number 18, 2018 SP 040001. 3156 Anderson Road, SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 14th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note that the June 14th meeting will be located at the School Administration Building at 3601 Bransford Avenue. Item number 20, 2018 NHL 002001 on page nine of your agenda. The Ivy Hall Neighborhood Landmark District. Staff recommendation is to defer to May 24th Planning Commission meeting. Item 21, 2018S 021001, the DRG Interchange Center Platt. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. And item number 24, 2018Z046PR001 on page nine of your agenda. A request to rezone from R6 to RM20A on JJ Watson Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 24th Planning Commission meeting. Excellent, thank you. And so we'll go through these items, make sure I didn't miss anything. So items, Commissioner, these are the items for deferral. Are items number one, three, five, six, seven, eight, 13, 14, 18, 20, 21, and 24, is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral. We'll need a motion. So moved. It's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on those items for deferral? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items will be deferred. <clears throat> on to item F, the consent agenda. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the entry of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be moved from the consent agenda. Items on consent. Item number four on page six of your agenda, 2017 SP 087001. The Hill Property SP to permit 145 single family lots. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 9A on page six of your agenda, 2018 CP 007001. The West Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 9B. 2018 Z043 PR001 on page seven of your agenda. 
This is a request to rezone to OR20 for property on 33rd Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve if the associated plan amendment is approved and disapprove if the associated plan amendment is not approved. Item number 10 on page 7, 2018 CP 008001, the North Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 12A, 2018 CP 010002, Green Hills Midtown Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to approve. The Associated Case 12B, 2018 SP 032001, the Centennial Garage SP. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. If the associated plan amendment is approved and disapprove if the associated plan amendment is not approved. Item number 15A, 2018 SP 036001, the Brian Paul SP on page eight of your agenda. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I will note that Chairman Atkins is recusing himself from that item. <laughs> item number 15B, 5585P004 on page eight, it's the associated case. It's a PUD cancellation to cancel a portion of a planned unit development. Staff recommendation is to approve if the associated zone change is approved and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. Item number 16, 2018 SP 037001 on page eight of your agenda. The 38th Avenue North SP to permit 10 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And item 17 on page eight of your agenda, 2018 SP 039001. The Fairview Meadows SP to permit five lots, including two two family lots. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page 10 of your agenda under other business, item 28 to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, commissioners. You've heard the items on the consent agenda, but we'll go through them one more time, make sure that we're correct. And the items uh, to be passed on the consent agenda are items four, 9A, 9B, 10, 12A, 12B, 15A, 15B, 16, 17, and 28. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard those items for the consent. We'll need a motion to approve the consent agenda. It's been a motion and second. Any discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Those consent agenda items are adopted. So. So the items tonight that will be heard for public hearing would be items 2A, B, C, uh, 2A, 2B, 2C, item 11, item 19, item 22, and item 23. So those are the items that will be considered. Everything else has either been deferred or passed on the consent agenda. So um, how about we give a moment, just kind of let everybody move in and out of the chamber here. And then we'll get started momentarily in just a few seconds. So this is like a Southwest flight. Everybody, probably all the seats will be taken, so get to know your friends. Come sit down so we're not in violation of the Fire Marshal, and we'll get everybody. And then if if y'all are finished, head on out. We appreciate it. All right, so let's get started on item 2A, Anna. Thank right. you. Appreciate item, it. Item 2A is a request to amend the Green Hills Midtown Community Plan. There's an associated rezoning and PUD cancellation that will be presented next. 
The request is to change the approximately seven acres outlined in red at the southwest corner of Edge Hill and 8th. The site is just west of I-65, east of MDHA's Edge Hill Apartments, north of the city reservoir and south of Rose Park. The site currently contains a number of the park at Hillside Apartments. The request is to change the urban neighborhood evolving policy to urban mixed use corridor in order to support the rezoning of the highlighted parcel and the adjacent parcels to the west and south to permit a mix of uses. The gray area shown here outlines the associated rezoning for 23 acres to go from multifamily residential RM20 and commercial service CS to specific plan mixed use. But parcel 24 is the only parcel requested for a policy change. Staff recommends approval of the change. The existing policies in the area, the light purple on the subject parcel and continuing west along the southern portion of Edge Hill is urban neighborhood evolving and currently contains a mix of predominantly multifamily housing. Uh, the policy, this policy is intended for moderate to high intensity residential neighborhoods with a broad mix of housing types and high levels of connectivity. Commercial uses are not compatible with this policy. The conservation policy shown in light green on a small section in the southern part of the site is highlighting the presence of steep slopes. The darker green areas to the south, northeast, and northwest are in open space policy for the city reservoir, Fort Negley, and Rose Park. The blue is civic policy highlighting the schools in the area. This hatched area along 8th is urban mixed-use corridor policy for the predominantly commercial uses, and this is the policy that's requested to be extended along Edge Hill. Urban mixed-use corridor policy is in, applied to major corridors and intersections with the intent of encouraging a balanced mix of higher density residential and mixed-use development. The applicant has proposed this change in order to allow retail office and multifamily residential at this location. Characteristically, these corridors are complete streets served by multiple modes of transportation and they prioritize the higher intensity mixed use and commercial uses at the intersection with multifamily residential preferred along the corridors between those intersections. On February 13th, planning staff held a community meeting to discuss the plan amendment request and process and answer questions. Council Member Sledge and the applicant and development team also fielded questions from approximately 30 members of the community. Many of the attendees were current tenants of the park at Hillside and so currently live on the subject property or on, within the bounds of the rezoning area and had attended one or more meetings held by the property owner or council member over the past year. Attendees were generally in support for the plan amendment and the introduction of a mix of uses along this portion of Edge Hill. The main concerns raised at that time were the process of rehousing the tenants, the affordability of the new rents, and the affordability and type of retail that may be introduced. Other issues discussed were primarily related to uses and densities allowed by the proposed policy and rezoning, the phasing of the development, the mix of unit sizes, security, traffic, and access. Staff believes that the proposed amendment area is a suitable location for urban mixed-use corridor policy for the following four reasons the appropriate application of this policy, the context of the site, the transportation infrastructure, and the urban design considerations that have been made. So first, with regards to the appropriate application of this policy, this is a zoomed in slide of the intersection of 8th and Edge Hill. The red outline outlines the current extent of the corridor policy, and the dashed red outlines the proposed expansion um, as I mentioned, urban mixed-use corridors are policy is applied to major corridors and intersections that are served by multiple modes of transportation and can accommodate residential, commercial, and mixed-use development. Um, as you can see along here, eighth, both 8th and Edge Hill are four-lane streets. Edge Hill is an arterial and, uh, sorry, 8th is an arterial and Edge Hill is a collector. Um, 
They're located in a heavily trafficked and populated area approximately two miles from downtown Nashville, making this a high, highly visible and accessible significant intersection of major streets. Um, additionally, applying this policy off of 8th along Edge Hill increases the depth of parcels available that would be viable for a mixed-use development at the intensity anticipated by this policy. For context, this is um, a countywide context slide that shows the growth and preservation concept map from Nashville Next. The site is outlined in the dashed black and white. You can see it's uh, less than a quarter mile from a tier one center and less than two miles from a tier one center of downtown Nashville. They're both shown in the dark orange. Uh, these centers are intended to be significant areas of development that contain a dense mix of shops, homes, jobs, and parks. Eighth Avenue is highlighted in the thick blue line is as an immediate need high capacity transit corridor. These transit corridors represent a framework of more intense housing and commercial areas along major roadways with frequent transit service. Infill development is encouraged along transit and multimodal corridors in between and immediately around tier one centers. For a, a look at the immediate context, another important aspect is the subject properties adjacency to and relationship with three historic sites important to the history of Nashville. Shown on this aerial is the subject property, again in the dashed outline. Directly to the south in the orange is the city reservoir, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and sits on the site of Fort Casino. To the northeast in the blue is Fort Negley, and to the northwest in green is Rose Park. Nashville Next states that the potential impacts of proposed developments on historic sites should be carefully considered and appropriate measures should be applied that mitigate any adverse impacts. Any development should be designed sensitively to address the importance of the visual relationship between these three sites. The slide shows the transportation networks in the area. There are four MTA bus stops located along the applicant's property's frontage along 8th and Edge Hill, and one of which is a transfer location. And Motion proposes more frequent service on 8th and a rapid bus route on Edge Hill. You can also see the significant amount of bus stops throughout the area. Both streets are planned to have major separated bikeways. And then 10th Avenue, which is highlighted in the dark green, is a significant pedestrian and bike connection along the western side of the applicant's property. This shows the capacity of the surrounding streets to accommodate multiple modes of transportation. Finally, this slide illustrates some of the urban design considerations that go into determining the appropriate height of buildings in this land use policy. Mm -hmm. Typical building heights in urban mixed use policy areas are up to five stories. Taller buildings and punctuations in height may be found along high capacity transit corridors and at major intersections along streets that are sufficiently wide to avoid the effect of a building overshadowing the street. The appropriate height is based on the building type, location, architectural elements, and surrounding context. This image illustrates some of the factors that go into the consideration of determining where punctuations of height greater than five stories may be appropriate. These include the surrounding land use policies, topography, the impact on adjacent historic structures, and the use of increased building setbacks and stepbacks. In addition, mixed-use corridor policy, again, prioritizes the higher intensity mixed-use at intersections with preference given to the residential uses between. Development at this subject property's location should respond appropriately to the transition from commercial to residential as you travel west along Edge Hill and south down hillside, with the building's height, scale, and massing decreasing and the setbacks increasing into the neighborhood evolving policy. The site's proximity to two tier one centers and I-65, its location on two prominent multimodal streets and the adjacency to existing mixed-use corridor policy make this an appropriate location for the extension of that policy. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the amendment request. Thank you. Well, Levi, you wanna go next? So Levi's gonna cover 
Commissioners, Levi is going to cover 2B and 2C. The next item on the agenda is item 2B. The request is to rezone from RM20 to C NCS to specific plan zoning to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions subject to approval of the associated plan amendment. The site is located at the intersection of Edge Hill Avenue and 8th Avenue South along Hillside Avenue. 8th Avenue runs north and south along the eastern property boundary and Edge Hill uh, runs east and west along the northern property boundary. As a point of reference, you see the reservoir here that was previously pointed out and the Edge Hill apartments that are located west of the site. The site is comprised of eight parcels totaling 23.32 acres and is currently developed with multifamily residential uses and various commercial and institutional uses located along 8th Avenue South. An important aspect of this property is the surrounding context in terms of historically significant sites in the immediate area. The historic reservoir site is located immediately south as seen here south of the project site and then Fort Nagley is located northeast of the site and Rose Park, formerly Fort Morton, is located northeast of the site. These sites possess a scenic relationship and are interrelated geographically, geo geologically, and historically. The property is currently zoned RM20 and CS. A wider look at the area shows a site located within a larger area of RM20 zoned property that extends further to the north and west. One and two family zoning can be found south of the site with some commercial zoning found along 8th Avenue South. A portion of the site is located within a residential PUD and is proposed to be canceled as a part of this request. <coughs> the site is located in the T4 neighborhood evolving and T4 mixed use corridor policy areas. A small portion of the site is located in the conservation policy area in response to steep slopes separating the project site from the reservoir property. Minimal, minimal to no disturbance in this area is proposed. In staff's evaluation of the plan, a number of factors were analyzed to ensure compatibility and consistency with the policies. These factors included the appropriate distribution of uses on the site with the most intensity located along the corridors, high levels of connectivity, design and orientation that meets the urban form and pedestrian realm, and providing thoughtful transitions to less intense policies. Another key factor in evaluating the plan was height. The plan covers a large area and therefore appropriate building heights differ from location to location. Staff looked at three points when analyzing the maximum heights across the proposed plan. The first point was emphasizing an appropriate height at street level that engages the pedestrian realm while allowing adequate light and air, creating an appealing urban streetscape. As you see here, the site has frontage on two prominent corridors in Edge Hill Avenue and 8th Avenue South. The second point was evaluating the potential visual impact that some structures could have on surrounding historical resources. As noted earlier, the project site is in proximity to three historically significant sites, the reservoir, Fort Nagley, and Rose Park, formerly Fort Morton. As noted on this image, the ring road of the reservoir, call it out right here, was used as a reference point in evaluating potential impacts. The ring road sits at an elevation of 646 feet and will be referenced more later in the presentation as an important height benchmark. The third point emphasized adequate transitions in height as the plan moves further into existing neighborhoods. Properties south and southwest of the project site are zoned for one and two family residential uses and are shown here highlighted in the blue next to the southernmost portion of the SP shown here in orange. The plan proposes a maximum of 1,200 residential units and a maximum of 600,000 square feet of non-residential space located at the northeast corner of the site. The plan is divided into seven distinct zones, each including specific permitted uses and bulk standards applicable to those zones. Access to the site is provided by Edge Hill Avenue, Hillside Avenue, and a new public street extending west from 8th Avenue South. The plan also proposes improvements to Summit Avenue at the southern end of the site and two stub streets to the adjacent property to the west, reestablishing the neighborhood grid. A series of internal drives provide circulation within the different zones of the plan. Structure parking is provided in zones one, two, and three, and for one multifamily building found in zone four. A combination of surface parking and private garages serve the remaining portions of the plan. 
The plan enhances bicycle and pedestrian facilities across the site as well as upgrading the existing pedestrian right-of-way bordering the western property boundary, shown here. Zones 1 and 2 are located at the northeast corner of the site along Edge Hill and 8th Avenue South. Proposed uses in zones 1 and 2 include multifamily, residential, office, commercial, and a hotel isolated to zone 1. Maximum heights are limited to 70 feet in zone 1 and 60 feet in zone 2, or an elevation not to exceed, exceed the ring road on the adjacent reservoir site, as noted earlier. Exceptions to the noted height restrictions are given for two tower elements within zones in 1 and 2. The tower in zone 1 is limited to a maximum height of 150 feet, while the tower in zone 2 is limited to a maximum height of 110 feet. Zone 3 is located just south of, of the proposed east-west street and north of the reservoir site. Uses in Zone 3 include multifamily residential, office, commercial, and live-work units. Maximum heights would be limited to 60 feet or an elevation not to exceed the ring road on the adjacent reservoir site, whichever is less. Zone 4 is located at the northwest corner of the plan along Edge Hill Avenue. Uses in Zone 4 will be limited to multifamily residential with maximum heights limited to 65 feet. Zone 5, located in the central portion of the plan, west of Hillside Avenue, is limited to multifamily residential uses with maximum heights not to exceed 55 feet. Zone 6 is located just west of the reservoir site. Zone 6 will be limited to multifamily residential uses. Zone 6 will be limited to multifamily residential uses and one and two family residential uses with maximum heights not to exceed 55 feet. Zone 7 is, in the, is located at the southwest corner of the plan, west of Hillside Avenue. Uses in Zone 7 include multifamily residential, single-family residential uses. Maximum heights for multifamily residential buildings are limited to 45 feet, while heights for the single-family buildings will be limited to 35 feet. Staff expressed concerns regarding the scenic relationship of the adjacent historic reservoir site and other historically significant sites in the immediate area and the potential impacts of this development. The plan was revised in regards to maximum allowed heights and building footprint orientation in zones one, two, and three in an effort to address these concerns. Additionally, conditions requiring additional view shed analysis upon the submittal of a final site plan could further mitigate any potential impacts as they pertain to view sheds. This model of the proposed SP was prepared by staff to further, further analyze the request. Here you see the model looking southwest of the site. As you can see, the plan proposes the tallest structures near the intersection and transitions heights as the plan approaches existing neighborhoods. This image shows the model looking southeast at the site. As you can see, the plan features significant step backs and thoughtful orientation to create a pedestrian-oriented urban form. The proposed plan achieves multiple goals of the land use policies. Some of these goals include the creation of attractive and functional streetscapes, enhanced connectivity, and the establishment of a neighborhood street grid, increased diversity in housing type, and thoughtful transitions to less intense policy areas. Additionally, the plan includes significant traffic improvements as noted on pages 30 through 36 in the staff report. These improvements are scheduled in four phases and include increased vehicle storage, road widening, installation of traffic signals, and enhanced bicycle and pedestrian facilities. In conclusion, staff finds that the plan is consistent with the land use policies and recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions subject to the approval of the associated plan amendment. The next item on the agenda is item 2C. The request is to cancel a portion of a planned unit development. Staff recommends approval of the PUD cancellation if the associated zone change is approved and disapproval if the associated zone change is not approved. As noted in the previous presentation, the site is located along Edge Hill Avenue and Hillside Avenue. This portion of the site totals 20.92 acres. The property is zoned RM20 and sits in a larger area of RM20 zoned properties that extends to the north and west. Properties to the east are zoned CS, while properties to the south are zoned one and two family residential. The project site makes up a portion of a large planned unit development. 
The plan unit development overlay district is an, is an alternative zoning process that allows for the development of land in a well-planned and coordinated manner, providing opportunities for more efficient utilization of land than would otherwise be permitted by the conventional zoning provisions of this title. This PUD is an older Res E PUD, residential PUD. The Res E PUDs were adopted in the early 1970s to recognize existing public housing developments that were put in place prior to comprehensive zoning. There was never a master plan adopted with this or any other Res E PUD. This portion of the PUD is currently developed with 290 multifamily residential units. The site is located in the T4 urban neighborhood evolving in conservation policy areas. The cancellation of the PUD to allow for the development of the associated specific plan is consistent with the land use policies for the area. The associated SP would continue to allow multifamily residential uses at a greater density and diversity in building type, consistent with the goals of the T4 neighborhood evolving policy. Staff recommends approval if the associated zone change is approved and disapproval if the associated zone change is not approved. That completes the presentation. Thank you, Levi. So we'll open the item for public hearing and the applicant will have 10 minutes and you can save two of your 10 minutes for rebuttal and welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Kleinfelder. Mr. Kleinfelder, you have to push the uh, middle button It's the and the light will come on. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Kleinfelter with the firm of Reno and Kavanaugh representing the uh, applicant. I, right now, I'm just going to ask that you do re reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Ben Miskelly with Kimley Horn is going to speak to the plan in, in detail. But first, uh, Ben Brewer with Elmington Capital would like to, to speak to the commission. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Brewer. I'm the president of Elmington Capital, the applicant. And Elmington is a very active affordable housing developer in the state of Tennessee. We currently have 1,800 units under construction in the state. 900 of those are in Nashville. Uh, it's something we're really proud of. Um, Shortly after acquiring this property in 2016, we began meeting with a lot of different groups. Uh, the Park at Hillside Tenants Association, Homes for All, Edge Hill Coalition, Neighbors of Reservoir Park, Friends of Fort Negley, and of course Councilman Sledge, who's attended most if not all of the 13 separate meetings that we've had. And there's a lot of people that are behind me who've spent a lot of time and energy over the course of the last 18 months uh, in meetings talking about this. Um, honestly, when we first started getting together, we didn't agree on much. But one thing we did agree on was that the existing homes on the property were not sustainable long term. And without a new proposal, the affordability at the Park and Hillside couldn't last. With that common ground, we created primary goals for the redevelopment. One was to provide new quality uh, long term affordable housing. Two was to create a development plan that did not displace the current residents that currently live at the Park and Hillside. Third was to bring together an affordable and market rate residential community that truly formed a mixed income community together. We also wanted to provide the opportunity for commercial uses such as a pharmacy, family medical services, grocery store, different uh, soft goods, clothing stores, and food options for nearby residents. Additionally, other, the other use of office space will allow for daytime use and vibrancy of the, of the community. Lastly, we've worked with a local nonprofit called Salama, whose property is on our site, uh, to put them in our new development. Uh, and that would be, that's a huge part of what we're doing. They provide after school programs for um, children in the Edge Hill community and other areas of town. Working together with the public and planning, we've agreed to one, consider traffic. Traffic is obviously a big conversation point in our city. And with this planning process, we've agreed to over seven pages of transportation improvements that are required in this SP. When the development's complete, the environment will be significantly better for pedestrians and cyclists. And with the conditions put forth by Public Works, they're designed to address the increase in daily traffic. We also worked with Edge Hill Coalition and the Friends of Fort Negley to address view sheds. And through the conversation and with the hard work of Metro Planning, Parks, and Historic, we were able to make changes to our plan, where we reduced heights of buildings and reconfigured how buildings laid out on our site to make sure we preserve views for, to and from the reservoir. <laughs> Lastly, through the work, working with the Park and Hillside Tenant Association, we came to an agreement to voluntarily provide 
an unprecedented level of affordable housing, which is something we're all really proud of. The program we utilize restricts units to 60% of area median income. In addition, we've agreed to seek to, to uh, restrict 25% of those units to 50% of the area median income. We believe and hope that this redevelopment will be looked upon as one of Nashville's greatest public-private partnerships for redevelopment. This, pro this rezoning will ensure long-term affordable housing for the residents of the Park and Hillside and the Edge Hill community for years to come. The affordable housing commitment on this property is not required, but the affordability would be lost without passing a rezone this rezoning request. I've prepared a letter documenting our commitment to the Park and Hillside residents and the community of this project that I want to submit uh, to the Planning Commission for the record tonight. Uh, but it outlines our commitment um, and responsibility regarding our commitment to affordable housing. Ben? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Ben Muscali with Kenley Horn. Um, I've been working with Elmington since 2017 on this project. This project's a big win for Nashville. As Ben pointed out, this is a huge commitment to affordability. This is unprecedented for a private developer. This property is a half mile away from the start of the downtown code. For this to be on this site, a huge deal. In addition to this, it provides a mixed use form that we don't really have on 8th yet. Barry Hill has it, but we don't. Um, that's a mile south of here. This mixed-use retail office, residential, has really transformed Berry Hill and is a major component of Nashville Next, talking about corridor redevelopment. Um, to walk through this, as we stated earlier, it's broken up into zones, and zone one and two along Edge Hill and eighth is that mixed-use corridor. Zone three, as you step down the reservoir, has live work on the ground floor, some retail on the ground floor. There we go. Um, and lines that new street. That street will help with our traffic flow as it reduces traffic that would be on Edge Hill from 8th to Hillside. These first three zones were studied at length with their impact on view sheds between the Reservoir, Rose Park, and Fort Negley. We are incredibly appreciative of the work of staff from Metro Parks, from Metro Historic, and from Metro Water for meeting with us and expressing their concerns. We changed the plan twice because of these concerns. We've tailored the site plan because of these concerns. The developers agreed upon standards that will help protect these view sheds permanently. Um, and we're gonna continue to study these as we approach final SB. The inclusion of these two taller components at the frontages of 8th and Hillside are provided to capitalize on Edge Hill and on 8th as being high capacity transit corridors. This is pointed out in the Green Hills Midtown Community Plan. It's also pointed out in Nashville Next. We worked diligently with staff to make sure these towers didn't have a negative impact on the community. From the street, these towers should be stepped back far enough to not pose any kind of shadow or any kind of major visual issue. As you move throughout the rest of the site, down southward, um, zones four, five, and six, and also seven, they step down. They transition into the neighborhood and they provide that single family transition as you get to the further point south of the project. To help with traffic, we extended Summit Avenue, which is kind of, there we go, that's awesome. Summit Avenue right there, we extended that to connect the hillside to connect the grid back. North of that, there's a right of way connection at Horton Avenue that would be through Envision Edge Hill and connect the street grid back. This property also invests a tremendous amount of effort in 10th Avenue as a bike and pedestrian path. Um, thank you for your time. All right. You guys want to reserve two minutes for your rebuttal? Correct. Is that correct? All right. Thank you for the presentation. Anyone here wishing to speak in support? Come on up if, you, if you're here to speak in support. And if you would, um, you get two minutes each, and the timer is right over here, so you can see the timer, and uh, state your name and your address, and then you, thank you. My name is Brittany Sears, and I live at 1131 Archer Street. As a resident of this neighborhood, I'm super excited about the plans um, that this developer has particularly for the commercial component. Right now we live in a commercial dead zone. In order to go to the grocery store or to um, the convenience store, we have to get into our car 
and go all the way down 8th or hop over to West End. So um, with, with these plans, we are going to be able to walk to these type of um, commercial buildings. So I'm super excited um, about um, the potential to walk to um, these different type buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, my name is <coughs> Joel Dark. I live at uh, 1027 15th Avenue South, uh, and I am speaking as a representative of an organization. I'm speaking as a representative of the Edge Hill Neighborhood Coalition. We'll give you five minutes. In. Thank you. Yep. Um, the Edge Hill Coalition was formed in 2015 and brings together Edge Hill neighborhood and community organizations around common areas of concern, including planning and land use. Working to come to terms with the scale and implications of the proposed hillside reservoir development over the last few months has been challenging for the coalition, but has also been a positive experience in building relationships, which, which will certainly endure, uh, with the other concerned groups, including, and these were mentioned earlier, uh, the Parks at Hillside, Tenants Association, the Neighbors of Reservoir Park, uh, which I had not known anything about um, prior to this process, um, and the Friends of Fort Negley. All of these groups, um, I believe, are represented at this meeting. I think some of them intend to, to present. Um, and members of the Edge Hill Coalition are also here um, in full support of our common concerns. The specific concerns of the Edge Hill Coalition center on the protection of the housing security of our neighbors and the protection of Edge Hill as a neighborhood. With schools, parks, churches, and other institutions, ultimately including neighborhood community character policy and zoning that deserve the same permanence and respect they would receive in 12th South, Hillsborough West End, or other neighborhoods. In the case of Edge Hill, these concerns are also framed by the history of urban renewal, which has left us more vulnerable than surrounding neighborhoods. I believe it is correct to say that members of the Edge Hill Coalition have the same central concerns regarding um, this proposed development. Um, we have had a lot of discussion about whether we should speak in favor or against, and I think there may be some people from the coalition who are speaking, um, who are speaking against. Um, the critical issue for me came down to the question of whether the concerns could be addressed within the framework of the proposal. Um, and I, I personally believe uh, that they can, um, but I believe that they remain very serious concerns. First, the Park at Hillside Tenants Association has worked over several months for the protection of the existing number of affordable units, as has, was referenced earlier, and they have successfully secured a one-to-one -one replacement of the 290 units within the larger development of 1,200 units and 600,000 square feet of non-residential space. The protection of these 290 units through a community benefits agreement or other appropriate mechanism is a minimum condition from the perspective of the Edge Hill Coalition uh, for supporting the proposed development. And that is indeed uh, the condition that, um, according to which we are willing to accept some other things that we are less um, happy about. Um, we have attended these meetings with the Park at Hillside uh, Tenants Association, and I can personally attest um, to how inspired I have been um, by their bringing authentic stories of people threatened by displacement to the table, um, their creativity. They had an, uh, an Easter weekend where they had an event called Hunt for Eggs, Not for Homes. I thought that was really good. Um, and they have also seized on this opportunity um, to assert their rights at this juncture to have their housing protected. And they have done that very effectively. And I don't think that that can be stated enough or recognized sufficiently. A second concern um, regarding the proposed development is the dramatic change to the character of the Edge Hill neighborhood through the height, massing, and density detailed in the SP and through the application of a corridor policy to a neighborhood. I'm not aware of any precedents in other Nashville neighborhoods for some aspects of the pro proposed development, including the 
plan to build two towers on Edge Hill Avenue with maximum heights of 10 and 11 stories respectively. And I had not until just now <laughs> re realized that one of those might be uh, potentially a hotel. Um, there are no such structures in Nashville located on a similar site, as far as I know, um, among three parks and across the street from two schools. There are obvious reasons, including traffic and safety, why one would not build towers in these locations and there is no compelling reason to build them. Although there are other conditions, including park access and connectivity, that would significantly improve the proposed development, limiting the height of the proposed towers is the single condition within the scope of the Planning Commission's discretion that would go furthest toward protecting the character of the Edge Hill neighborhood and improving the future integrity and potential of the site. The two suggested frameworks for this that have been discussed within our groups are a five-story limit, which is applied to the other buildings on the, on the site, um, and the height of the ring road about around, the, around the reservoir. Um, I think either of those would be very, very acceptable. Um, as I've looked at these images that have been presented, um, these are all great, um, but they are not 11-story buildings. Um, and I think it's Thank very you. important to recognize we, what we're, we what we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next. Come on up. So just so you all know the rules, so it's two minutes for individuals, but if you represent the a neighborhood or a neighborhood association, you get five, so. Okay. Well, uh, my name is George Davis. I live at 1422 Hillside Avenue. I am a member of the uh, uh, Parker Hillside Tennis Association, but I don't really care to speak for them. Uh, we are in, in agreement. Uh, that uh, the project should be built. But uh, I'd just like to say for myself personally, um, I've been living there for about four and a half years and there's been multiple owners on the property. It's a 45 year old property and it's been kept, you know, different people being in there doing what they do. And um, so, you know, we've got most of us that live there have kids of some kind. And um, the first thing I think is that, you know, the kids need a good place to live. Um, now, Elmington has been very receptive. I understand I, before I came along, it's been about two years that they've been trying to get this thing together and they've been basically negotiating and it seems like they've tried to accommodate as many people as they can and try to get, you know, the project done. Um, but, uh, I don't know, like I said, you know, the, the kids need a good place to live. Kids uh, today, uh, as we know, you know, are having a, more problems now lately, it seems like, than ever. And uh, so I've noticed in talking to them, being around them, knowing my own kid, uh, a good environment definitely makes a huge difference. Uh, with this situation, they'll be able to see other people, homeowners, home renters, uh, get a different perspective, uh, different ideas. And uh, so, you know, they'll be able to walk. I, I remember the old days when you used to be, I'm almost 50, so you could walk most places, and that's no more. So, you know, they'd be able to walk to different things. I've heard there was going to be a, a grocery store there. And so, like it's been said before, that's a grocery store desert. That's a basically everything desert, even though it's right outside of downtown Nashville. So um, there's a great need for uh, retail. Uh, it's a good location for the current residents and hopefully for the future residents for transportation because the downtown hub, the bus station, is, you know, uh, where they do the transfer and, and the 65. You, had, you got your two minutes. Sir. <laughs> All right. Thank it you. It goes by fast when you start talking, so I apologize. We're going to. Thank you. We're, uh, it's not beeping, so we're, if you watch the clock, it will, it will beep now, hopefully, so. Yeah, we'll we'll start them over. And then Reclaiming I'll, my time. No, no, we'll we'll start you at two, we'll start you at at two minutes. We, okay, then. we're fair here. Okay, go right. ahead. Right, I appreciate it. I'm a resident of Park at Hillside, uh, and I'd like to call the effort that Elmington, uh, uh, the Metro Development, well, MDHA, and us as a win for everyone. Um, and that's because uh, the Nashville way refers to racial um, etiquette and 
Nashville's history of, of, of just coming together and being a, a moderate progressive. And I was actually thinking, that's a great, great name, but as it turned out, there's a, a book already written called The Nashville Way, uh, and it came out in 2012 to ad address that. Firstly, Elmington um, has the ability to do it. They do massive. You, if you know on 18 Church Street or on Charlotte, they know how to do this. So we're, we're appreciative of that. And it's also like someone uh, generally speaking, oh, they're going to come in, we have to move. And you generally think, oh, is it going to be better? Is it going to be in an Antioch where it's no, tr no transit or less? So I'd like to appreciate them for dreaming a dream bigger than us to, to be able to stay there. Um, I'd like to also thank um, D Director Harbison uh, at MDHA, and he says there will be no more public housing. And his initiatives to uh, just take them down and uh, put people into very nice places uh, is, I think, an impetus because that was the first um, public, the Metro bought federal land and they, you know, hey, let's just do it. Uh, as you know, we are on 8th Street and 12th Street. Uh, sorry. Nope, that's, see that two minutes goes by very All quick, right. but give us your name and address just so we Certainly. have it for record. Barbara Shelbourne, 1416 Hillside Avenue. Thank you for coming you. down, appreciate it. State your name and your address. Yes, good afternoon, my name is Paulette Coleman. I live at 6205 Willow Oak Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. I chair the Affordable Housing and Gentrification Task Force of NOAA, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope. NOAA is a 61 plus member organization comprised of unions, faith-based groups, and community organizations. In our work with affordable housing, we have seen many instances where developers have been totally non-responsive and almost disrespectful of tenants. We would like to say that in discussions with the various tenants groups, some of whom are members of NOAA, there has been a process, and a process that was inclusive, and a process that was open to possibilities. And for that, we are most appreciative. Yes, we would have appreciated if there were 590 affordable housing units, but in most of the sit projects that have taken place, the existing number of affordable units has been reduced to zero. This is a con, this is an example of where that does not have to be the case. We support the changes and because the council member, the various organizations, the tenants association also do, we think this is a model that perhaps needs to be amplified throughout Nashville. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming down. Welcome. Hello, my name is Kenita Patterson, and I'm an organizer with Homes for Our Nashville. I stand in solidarity with the Tenants Association. I myself was a tenant in 2016, along with many others that were displaced from Parker Hillside. Uh, we stand in solidarity with this zoning as long as the affordability and no displacement is attached and remains to protect the residents residing at the Park Hill side. This is very important because residents are expended daily and true affordable housing is obsolete in Nashville, is not replaced after development, much less in the city. It's not attentioning the affordable housing crisis, crisis deficit. There's nowhere to go, literally, in this city. We do commend Elmington for stepping up and being the first of what we hope will become many and also normal to do what is right by the people. They met us at the table, listened, and met us in the middle for that we do support and as the residents demand, demands remain attached to the specific planning of the land. And also, um, there is a stack of petitions signed by the residents that stand in solidarity that was submitted to the Planning Commission as well. We have them. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Josiah, um, and I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm a tenant at um, Hillside at uh, 1418, and uh, I am definitely in full support of, of the uh, redevelopment plan. Um, and um, I would echo what has already been said that that uh, we have we have um, conditions and 
and uh, think things that we want to see in place and this this don't be just where they stop because I feel that it is a, a humanistic right that all humans um, have affordable housing um, no matter where you come from uh, and I feel that with people who have children or whatever they 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 also have a right to 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 raise their kids in a nice clean environment um, and um, that's that's all I really have to say thank you for coming down welcome Hello, my name is Austin Sauerbra, and I'm an organizer with Homes for All Nashville and also work with the Edge Hill Neighborhood Partnership. Um, and I've been working in the Edge Hill community for close to five years now. Um, member of the Edge Hill Coalition um, and have worked some with the, the Park of Hillside tenants. And I just want to state our support for this development. As many others have said, it's very rare that these sort of affordability agreements are actually entered into by private developers. That said, I think we also want to reiterate that our communities daily are being ravaged by development. We, we get calls from folks literally every day that are getting displaced because someone comes in, buys a property, raises as a rent 300 bucks, and they have to move to the edge of the city or outside the county. And what we would petition with this is what's going on here with this redevelopment, securing 290 units out of a potential 1,200 this should not be a something that a group of tenants has to work a year in negotiations to get. This needs to be the norm. Um, and so we very much appreciate the process and we are um, thrilled that there will be a development with non-displacement and that there will be long-term affordable units in this development. Um, but again, this needs to be the norm, not the exception. Um, Thousands of folks are getting pushed out every month um, and would encourage um, folks on the Planning Commission, as you are able, as law permits, to please consider that when zoning changes come up before you. Um, so yeah, that's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Welcome. My name is Emily Pruitt. I live at 828 West Argyle Avenue and I represent the neighbors of Reservoir Park. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Elmington for recognizing us as a very newly formed neighborhood association in the past year and for inviting us into their offices to have candid conversations with us as literally the Reservoir Park is our backyard. Um, we live along Hillside and along West Argyle Avenue and so we are very impacted by um, this proposed development. We um, are very thankful for Elmington for keeping our existing 290 tenants or units of tenants of neighbors that exist now in the affordable housing units. They are also our neighbors. Um, we are very thankful for Elmington for continuing to have those folks as our neighbors. We see them in the park every day. They know my dogs by name and all of our other, our other neighbors as well. Um, we support overall the the plan we do have some reservation about the the density of the traffic on the streets in which we live the 290 units of affordable housing is only 30 percent of the 1200 units that are being um, proposed not to mention the commercialism and the office space and one thing that i do want um, all of us to keep in mind is that there are over 3,300 parking spaces in parking decks and parking lots that are proposed with this plan, and our streets are already very crowded. And those streets are very crowded and block us into our driveways already. And so I would just like to bring attention to that as we consider this process going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Summers. Mr. Chairman, John Summers, 5000 Wyoming. I'm here on behalf of Historic Nashville as a board member. It's my understanding that the staff has worked with the developer and, and that there is an agreement in terms of the viewscape, and I just want to thank everyone for doing that. But this is a historic property. Uh, it was Casino Hill uh, during the Civil War, and as we see more and more development, uh, we hope there'll be more sensitivity to the viewscape uh, that we're losing um, with some development. And so, but thank you. Apparently, it's my understanding there's a letter that's been submitted to you all and this has been resolved. So, thank you very much. Yeah, I believe that uh, the commissioners, we have that. Yes, we have the letter in front of us. It was placed in front of you before the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? 
Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? And Councilman, I want to make sure we'll, we usually get for you to go last. Is that okay with you? I want to make sure. Okay. Anyone who wishes to speak in opposition, if y'all will line up. And then same, same drill. Uh, individuals will get two minutes and please state your name and your address. We appreciate you coming down. Uh, my name is A.V. Long. I live at 1222 15th Avenue South, but I am reading a statement for a neighbor who was unable to be here today. Overall, the proposed plan undercuts so much of what our community, our city, and even our country have collectively worked for. Number one, the Edge Hill community has advocated for affordable housing so that our neighbors and families are not displaced because of development. It is in the spirit that we ask Elmonton to commit to long-term affordability with a binding agreements. Number two, the concentration of rent restricted units into one building puts poor and working class people into a separate area. This is the definition and origins of the term and practice of ghettoizing. As we all know, this results in racial segregation. From today's vantage point, we should not be entertaining the idea of segregation, but instead do everything to overcome it. Number three, the land use policy and designation of neighborhood evolving are to create and enhance creative, innovative, and environmentally sensitive development. Any policy and zoning changes then should sustain, innovate, and enhance the neighborhood and history. The immediate surroundings of this development is a community of schools, a library, playgrounds, neighborhoods, and a trifecta of historical urban parks. Fort Negley, Reservoir Park, and Rose Park. We have fought for and continue to fight for the preservation of these parks that sit on hilltops. A tall building of 11 stories would overshadow, literally and figuratively, these parks and residential neighborhoods, our community's history and spirit, rather than enhancing them. And this letter is from Ben Tran at 1022 Villa Place. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Next. Hi, my name is Kate Hatfield. I don't live in Edge Hill, but I wrote my thesis on the history of the neighborhood um, and the effects of unchecked development. So I have a little history thing. Um, when the Burgett Hill site was renovated in 1998, Edge Hill residents had concerns about these reservations when it would turn the complex into a gated community with its own amenities, for all intents and purposes, cutting it off from the rest of the neighborhood. Elmington's proposed development, which includes the park at Hillside, is part of the neighborhood design plan that Edgel residents created with the Nashville Civic Design Center in 2005. That plan proposed that the area be put back into the pre-urban renewal street grid and adding single-family detached houses. The fact that Edgel has voiced concerns over developments like the one proposed and requested that the historical street grid be restored before is worth noting. It's incredibly frustrating that areas like that are, were destroyed during urban renewal seem to be considered fair game for further thoughtless development in future. Devaluing places like the Park and Hillside for lack of historical character and continuing to ignore some of the clearly stated articulated wishes of Edge Hill is it's absurd. <clears throat> Reverend Bill Barnes, whose name is invoked for a variety of Nashville's affordable housing programs, proposed doing away with high density, large developments entirely and was opposed to the concentration of lower income units. That was one of the aims of urban renewal. Elmington should, if it means to include affordable units in the development, not concentrate those units into a single building. Um, and uh, Edge Hill has historically been a food desert. Um, so the proposed retail is good, but with these kinds of developments, the retail is usually not affordable for the people that use the affordable housing. It's just something to think about. That's it. And please, you still need to state your name and your address. Oh, Kate Hatfield, uh, 915 Beaufort Place. Thank Sabrina you. Lipscomb. Appreciate you coming. Good afternoon. Uh, B. Thompson, 200 Rolling Fork Court. I am here with the Friends of Fort Negley Board, and most of them couldn't be here because of the budget hearings going on right now. Uh, so I've come, and they would have done a, a far more eloquent job than I at discussing this, but there, uh, there are two things that I want to talk about, and that's the massing and the height uh, and how it will affect the historic uh, Fort Negley and the other historic areas in, a, uh, in question, the reservoir and Rose Park, and I brought some pictures. I, I think that that, uh, that that will do more than I can explain at this point. Um, you can pass the pictures over here. All right. Get them out. Yeah. If I could 
tell you about them. Oh yeah. This you, is a, sure. a center a centerpiece up on the top of the fort, the fort ruins, where um, there's a display about how this fort was used in the war and what where it was. And if you, as I pass it to you, you'll see the view uh, is looking out toward the reservoir and how uh, the the height of the buildings will affect. Um, will affect what you see the, ex the visitors experience up at the fort. Again, it may be hard to see right like this, but when I pass it to you, Will, there are a few of these. This is where they lined up the cannons, if you will. Uh, this is a modern day interpretation that you can see where the cannon was firing and exactly read all about how the battle uh, were to be fought. And uh, those are looking right at the reservoir. Here's another one of those. Again, the visitor experience up there. Um, I just wanted to bring these to show you what we have now and, uh, and to ask that you really look closely at the massing and the height that is going on there. And I, I wouldn't say that um, I don't really know what you have agreed to at this point, but um, it doesn't sound like that unless it was really reduced that you could get the get the height down and the number, <clears throat> excuse me, the numbers down. And also what I've become aware of this afternoon is that uh, rent restricted areas are located in one area and that really is against all principles. We are taught about mixed housing, mixed income housing. So thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Welcome. Commissioners, my name is Ronald Miller, life resident of Edge Hill, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Edge Hill Coalition, which I am the facilitator. Uh, first, I want to thank Hamilton and this great association, neighborhood residents, who have worked diligently. We attended meetings with them, and the process that they went through was very enlightening, and you would be proud to know how they sat there and worked hard to come to this agreement. We think it's wonderful that they are able to bring these 296 units. But what we are looking at as a coalition, too, is at what cost is this coming to the Edge Hill community? It kind of reminded me, and I'll keep it short, like your meeting today, this is when we first came in. How would you like to be in a meeting where the room was packed every day, where it was full like this? You know, in a month after elections is over, you'll return back home. But what we are seeing is Edge Hill growing, pulling out stuff. We're looking at 1,200 units. We have Envision Edge Hill coming and we have other projects that are slated to this project. We don't want to be like this room was when we first came in here today. We still would like to live in a nice, viable area, but this is what we're doing. So we're saying it's great, it's working for this community, but at what cost? Is there gonna be an adverse impact on us over the years? And these are the things that we're looking at. We come and talk, and things get passed, but at what cost do we suffer? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello? Hello. My name is Betty Davis. I live at 1105 Algar Avenue. And I would simply like to say, the 290 units is good, but because of the housing crisis, I think we should have more. In fact, I think we should have had. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Councilman, do you want to go or do you want to go after the developer's time? Okay. Two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Again, I'm David Kleinfelter with the Reno Cavanaugh firm. And I'll jump around a little bit, but try and be really fast. First of all, this has been such an exciting project for me, frankly, to work on. 
staff may not know it from how we, we argued, talked, discussed a lot, but I really have been thankful for the amazing amount of work they put in on your behalf, on behalf of the city on this project. And, and frankly, Elmington is just a uniquely in incredible company. As you heard, they're already doing 900 affordable units, including the partnership at 12th and Wedgwood that's uh, under construction nearby. So that's really very important when people worry about whether it's going to get done. This isn't just some company that goes, yeah, 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 we'll do your affordable, don't worry about it. They get it, they've done it, and they do excellent units, and um, uh, it'll be it'll be integrated. You heard the concern about the concentration of it. It's, it is all one big piece of property, and this, yes, the building has to be separate. That's purely a, law, a matter of the financing. Um, some of you may know better than others that you, you can't get the tax credits to, that are required in order to do um, housing like this without, and you can't just disperse it. It has to be a single entity, a single purpose entity in order to, to make it really a reality at all. It's, it's an unfortunate reality, but that's what it is. So it is actually at the gateway to the community. It's right there. It will be at the corner more or less of Hillside and, and Edge Hill. Um, the views, those have been addressed in lots and lots of pushing down. I understand the towers are tall, but it's kind of like a balloon in order to make the whole project work. Agreed on all the, the heights that will protect various view sheds. Um, and uh, the density, this is Nashville Next uh, appropriate. You're, there's one small policy change, and if you've seen where the kind of juts in there on the policy, that's Metro-owned property. If it was private, it would probably make sense for that policy line to go straight on down hillside. But um, so we think that's, you're going to have people moving here. It's kind of where they need to be. So consider my 10 seconds a gift. <laughs> Go Preds. All right. <laughs> Councilman, come on up. Welcome. And you have unlimited amount of time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, I appreciate the work of all the commissioners. And I think if you did not know before, it is a great privilege to serve District 17 uh, based on the testimony that you heard today. Um, so I want to work through a few different things. And I will try to be um, as expedient as possible. Um, it was referred to a little bit um, about what this property has been. This property, and I may get a little bit of the details wrong, but bear with me. This property was under basically Bank of America uh, for years and years. And it was the footprint that you see today. Um, it was maintained primarily for its tax credits. I think maintained is a very generous word um, to say what Bank of America did. Um, after that, they it transferred to the hand of an out-of-state landlord um, who did even less. Um, and my interaction with the Park at Hillside property um, after I was elected really started with one of the speakers who spoke here earlier. Um, and she was calling because she was about 10 days from being evicted. She got one month behind her rent and she was told to get out. Um, she had a family. She was the only one that I got. I got multiple calls um, and I was put in a pretty helpless position. That was when I was first introduced to the previous landlord um, who was just as horrible for me to deal with as I'm sure the tenants had to deal with as well. Um, after Elmington purchased this property, um, these talks really actually began. These talks have been going on in some way, shape, or form since December of 2016 um, about what would happen with this property, what was the opportunity with this property, and quite frankly, what came first and foremost in many of the early conversations we had is what had happened with this property and everything that had been neglected. So in a lot of the meetings that we have had, yes, we've talked about a vision, but we also have talked about the fact that these units had not been maintained, that people were living in conditions well below any person should, and quite frankly, it was appalling. And so out of that, Park Hill Side Tenant Association formed. It has been a pleasure to work with them, um, and I have been privy to many of the conversations that have occurred between the applicant and the tenant association and the multiple other neighborhood groups and associations that you've heard from today. Um, it has been a really incredible process. Um, so let me walk, walk through a little bit of design, because I think for anyone who is unfamiliar with this design, and I don't want to you know, kind of try to gloss over everything, it's a lot. It is a lot. I, I, I'm asking for a lot of my constituents, um, and I hope that the trade-off is worth it. Um, there is commercial density that is proposed on the corridor. Um, it has been part of some of the related efforts um, that have been alluded to, where this is a food desert, there are basic services that don't exist, um, and there is an opportunity to bring those in. That has been a big part, actually, of conversations between um, the association and the applicant about what kinds of services those will be. And while we can't 
write in that there are specific things. Those conversations have been ongoing and I think productive and they're going to continue. Um, you've seen and it's been spoken to about reducing, reducing the density into the neighborhood. I do want to speak specifically about the view shed piece. Um, a conversation that was convened by planning about a month ago, and I honestly cannot thank planning staff enough. Um, I think every person in the design team at some point has been involved on this project. Um, in, the, in the conversation that was convened with historic, with parks, uh, with planning, with water, with the applicant, um, planning is, and especially Lee presented to present an alternative scenarios, basically, to what was presented. And one of the big things that came out of that was reducing the height around the ring road um, of the of the reservoir where there were those view sheds. The view sheds between, I'm looking at Lee in case I get anything wrong, but um, um, the view sheds to Fort Negley especially were important, and those, those building heights were reduced to the ring road height, which is approximately five stories or 60 feet. Um, the view shed to Rose Park as well is one where working through multiple designs and I think designs that are going to continue that the view shed will be maintained between Rose Park and the reservoir. The big context here is the fact that the city intends at some point to open up reservoir and make it a true reservoir park. Right now you cannot get up there, none of us can get up there unless we have special permission or we are committing vandalism um, up to the top of reservoir, uh, uh, the reservoir and that happened after 9-11 um, to secure our water sources. Water has been in the process of planning, gaining funding to put two separate tanks into the reservoir to finally move water off of that reservoir wall. Um, those of us who are aware of the history is that that reservoir has failed before. It was 100 plus years ago, but it has failed. Um, so that has been a major condition of water. You saw the conditions with historic and the conditions with parks as well. My sincere hope is that this actually speeds those processes up. Um, is that if there is a commitment to do this project, that there is a commitment from the city to say, okay, we need to make sure that we are working in tandem um, to provide that public access to that space that we have not had. Um, I think there's a, there's been also a conversations, I think in one of the slides, there was a, a point toward like an amenity deck and a, a way for the private development basically to tie into the public space for the public good. Um, so those conversations are ongoing, but those are all, those all have been very present. Um, I want to move to infrastructure because I, there was a reference made to the 2005 design plan for Edge Hill and it does indeed call for the restoration of the street grid. Um, and that was 2005, and in 2018, those have been no closer to being restored. This helps start that process. It helps us to start restoring that street grid that can be continued with the property to the left of this image, which is part of Envision Edge Hill. That's the MDHR property. So those conversations have been ongoing, have been, um, and will continue um, with the Edge Hill community. But that's the opportunity, I think, that we have quite frankly, to do 20 years of infrastructure uh, proposals that haven't occurred um, to, to be able to start that. It also, um, to the to points about traffic, there's on-street parking that is um, required. There is signalization that will be required that has not been. Um, and I completely uh, agree uh, with the concerns and ongoing discussions that we have to have about Hillside Avenue in particular. The last thing I want is for people to be blocked basically between Wedgwood and Edge Hill. Um, so, so working through that signalization I think is important. And again, this provides a way for us to do this that quite frankly as a city, we just haven't done. Um, the last part of this that has not really been discussed is that within the conditions that you see, it also improves greatly our bike uh, network, including um, the requirement of bike share stations within this proposal. That's important because there is no southern loop to the, to the uh, bike share network right now. I, th I think a lot of the gripes of many of us has been that the bike share program has unfortunately been kind of more utilized for tourist and tourist heavy areas. Um, this provides the opportunity to actually start connecting a bike share network through the southern portion. And my hope is that we will move toward what other cities like Philadelphia has done to make bike share accessible to the unbanked because that is a major concern and um, what I think would need to be a requirement um, for this for our community to be, know that there's economic access to multiple forms of transportation. Um, finally, you know that this is on a transit corridor. Um, this, I would hope, would help increase the, um, the 
infrastructure and there is infrastructure that's required regarding transit in there. Um, I remember very vividly talking to members of the Parkett Hillside uh, community three years ago when they were waiting for a bus that, where the signs attached to utility pole right in the sun with no shelter whatsoever. Um, I do want to speak very briefly to policy and then I will talk about affordability. As you notice, the property to the north is CI, it's civic institution. That means that even though this is, and I do not want to downplay this at all, incredibly dense. This is incredibly dense. It does mean that the properties to the north are under our control, under the city control. It's civic institution policy. They would not be developed under that policy. And then you have Rose Park Middle that's to the northwest of this property. You've heard about how Salama is part of this. You've heard about the need for services. And I want to talk about the affordability. Um, it, this is the second potential housing crisis that we can avoid in the district um, in the last month. Um, the first one was a resolution that passed council a couple of weeks ago regarding 564 units at Trevecca Towers. Um, those are basically the largest sort of project-based voucher um, units that we have in the county. Um, and to put it in perspective, those tax credits expired. If those units had gone to market, we would have had a housing displacement issue seven times the size of what happened at the Rob James Robertson apartments, seven times. But because we had a willing seller and a willing buyer and a willing government to work together, those units are going to get new tax credits, they're going to get 25 million in renovations, and they're going to remain affordable. That's the opportunity we have here with the 290 units that are occurring right now, which again, are not in good shape. Elmington has worked on maintenance. There are still things to be done, and I don't want to gloss over that. But we have an opportunity to do one for one replacement with new tax credits um, at the same site, and then to bring in the kinds of services and infrastructure that, quite frankly, we all say that we want when it comes to affordable housing. Um, there is no good answer for the design piece, and I fully accept that. Um, I know that it's difficult to say we would put all the affordable units in one piece, and then the other pieces might be market rate or commercial, whatever it might be. Um, as I have worked with the applicant in the neighborhood, um, we have been working through how do you create common spaces, right? How do you create common green spaces, things that tie, that ensure that even though this is a parcel that would be, you know, sort of the first thing to work on, quite frankly, the first thing that would come up, how do we ensure that it is integral to everything that occurs over here? And I include the Envision Edge Hill process in that. Um, the neighborhood, I, I feel fairly confident in saying if the neighborhood had told me, the tenant association had told me that that was a major issue for them, I, I really would have gone back and seen if there was anything we could do, and I have talked with the applicant on it. Um, the tenant association has made clear to me that they want to stay in their neighborhood. Um, and I want to do everything to do that. So, there are a couple other things that are happening here. Um, Envision Edge Hill is happening here. We're also working on um, a conservation overlay as well that's in other parts of, of Edge Hill because I know I'm asking a lot of the district here and of the neighborhood. And so, what I have asked is that density be placed on the corridors where appropriate under Nashville Next, that we maintain the affordability, and then we protect the neighborhood character on the internal uh, portions of the neighborhood just as Nashville Next prescribes. Um, so my hope is that all of these conditions will be met, that we work in current policy, and quite frankly, we work together in a way that I think several speakers have indicated should be the norm but isn't. Um, and so I hope we can do that going forward. Um, a couple of quick notes on the SP. Um, I will not be permitting short-term rentals. I'm in East Nashville. I feel obligated to say that. Um, uh, there will not be a hotel use either. That's on the permitted use. Thank you. Um, that, that is a permitted use currently, but will not be a permitted use by the time it comes to council. And I've spoken with the applicant about that. Um, and then finally, I just have a lot of thanks to give. Um, I've thanked the planning staff before, and I cannot thank them enough. Um, I want to thank Elmington. I want to thank the Edge Hill Coalition. I want to thank the neighbors of Reservoir Park. Um, I want to thank the five different departments that have worked on this, planning, historic parks, public works, and water. And if I've forgotten one, I'm very sorry. Um, I want to thank NOAA um, for, on short notice, analyzing this and deciding that they were going to be in support of it. Um, I do not take their support lightly, and I think that it is pretty integral to getting affordable housing done in the city. 
Um, and finally, I want to thank the Parker Hillside Tenant Association. Um, they have been, um, <clears throat> they've been really inspiring. Um, and I hope that other communities throughout the city see what they're doing um, and do the same. So thank you for indulging me in commission and um, those will conclude my comments. Thank you, Councilman. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. We really appreciate you coming down. You've done a lot of work on this. So seeing no other discussion, we'll declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Haynes, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you know, you've been here the longest, you say, so you go for sure. But before we do that. Sure. Yeah, but f before we get started, uh, Commissioner, I want to do point out that there are three separate items here. So we can we're going to we can discuss them all, but how we're going to have to take the vote is we'll have to do 2A first and then we can combine and do 2B and 2C together since if that's what you all feel comfortable with, but we can discuss them them all together, but we'll have to have a separate vote. Go ahead, Commissioner. Um I want to commend everyone in this room. This is a very complicated process. These large-scale rezonings, these large-scale mixed-use projects take hours, and the fact that Elmington didn't rush this through, that the neighborhood took time to meet, that's what this process is supposed to be like. So congratulations to everybody in the room. Um, having said that, because it is so complicated, you need talented people to go execute it. I think we are very blessed in this community with people like Elmington who are committed to affordable housing and yet integrating mixed use, integrating bike paths, integrating walkable neighborhoods. So I, I think this is a fabulous plan. I would encourage the council person and Elmington as you go through the council reading, the one thing that bothers me is the height in zone one, but you do have a condition that you will prepare, prepare view sheds modeling that on that corner. Um, I think 150 feet on that corner is too high, but I think the condition number two protects it. So, Councilman, if you'll just commit to do that as this goes through council readings, then I'm going to support this. Commissioner Sims. I also want to commend everybody that's been involved. Um, I live in Edge Hill, so this is very precious to me. I don't live anywhere near Hillside, but I do understand. Um, Edge Hill, in so many ways, is the epitome of what's happening to our city. It's a one square mile that is being pressured on every single side, from the Gulch to Belmont University to Vanderbilt University, now to 8th Avenue. And what's being asked here is almost 30% between this and Envision Edge Hill of the entire buildable spots in Edge Hill. So that is, as, as our council person said, a huge ask. I wish that we weren't all so excited about affordable housing. I wish this was the norm for our city, that this would just be the expected thing of moral and quality developers. I have worked with Ben a lot, and I find him to be a man of integrity. I trust what you say. But we're asking a lot of this neighborhood, <clears throat> particularly when we haven't defined as a community what density means, other communities have, or proximity. So now we're saying that, okay, we'll just absorb what will be 4,000 new places when Envision Edge Hill comes in, and we're just close to other big parts of the city, so this is okay. This has so much impact on individual lives. And this isn't a moral issue or a political issue. This has to do with truly the political stability of our nation when we have diverse people living together. So there's a lot of things that bother me here. Um, we're messing with historical properties. We're actually messing with our environment in so many ways when we start putting this many people in one place. And I think in so many ways, we're also asking our own Edge Hill neighborhood to sacrifice a lot. And so I've struggled with this ever since I've known it was coming for months. And yet I fall back on this one thing that says, if you save one life, you save the world. And if we can house one person in a city where there is no affordable housing, then I'm gonna have to support it. 
Thank you. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I be recognized? Yes, yeah. Our attorney, our uh, uh, staff attorney. Uh, it is the opinion of Metro Legal that given state, recent state legislation, uh, affordable housing cannot be a consideration in the approval or approval of any project uh, concerning zoning redevelopment. So I thought that should be noted. Thank you. <laughs> Duly noted. So noted. Commissioner Gowan. Wow, one more complication. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I, uh, I've been on this commission for about a year, and it's amazing the number of times I agree with both sides. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the developer and the team that put together is truly to be commended for going through this process. It is, I know a little bit about that, and it's just amazing the patience and the, and the uh, compromises that you have to go through to do something like that. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Haynes about the concerns about the view sheds, uh, and I am concerned about uh, the uh, about all of the affordable units being in one spot. Uh, but I think this accomplishes what we have to accomplish to keep Nashville a viable city, and so I'm going to support it. Thank you, Commissioner. And before we get to the next commissioner. Our staff attorney's name, I want him to state his name just so everybody knows. Uh, he, he's name, new, so to us, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Justin Marsh. So Justin Marsh made that last comment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Commissioner, go ahead. Welcome, Justin. Um, so I, I also feel pretty torn, and I can agree with everything that's been said here. Um, and Commissioner Sims, I totally agree that it's sad that we're so excited about affordable housing, even though we're not considering that piece of this. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's very important. I think um, one of the comments that was made and that I've been thinking about a little bit is we don't necessarily think of how this affects kids when they're displaced and again, uh, displaced. Again, that's not what we're considering here. But um, I do, from a planning perspective, really appreciate the incredible amount of work that went into this. I know that it's been a long road um, with a lot of considerations, um, and I think at this point, I'm inclined to support it. Commissioner? So I think um, I really respect what all the other commissioners have already said, and I think they've um, spoken eloquently. Um, I agree with Commissioner Haynes on the issue of the height and how it seems to be um, already addressed in um, that one condition. I don't quite understand why all the affordable units have to be in one building. Um, but I respect the neighbors and all of these various organizations that have already worked on this and agreed on it. And I think that um, one, two, three, four, five um, organizations that have been in favor of this, and I, and I feel they know what they're talking about. They know their community and they know what they want, and I respect that. So um, I feel like everything that's been done here to design this well and to work with the community is really amazing, and I will support it. <coughs> Commissioner Tibbs. And just uh, to note, Commissioner Tibbs uh, did come in just slightly late, but we were going, we were reviewing the staff report, and so um, it. Yeah, I was about to say um, I did review the staff report beforehand, so. And then you heard all yeah, the testimony. I, all I wanted those. to make sure, and, and our staff attorney says that's okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so noted. Um, Typically, I'm more torn on these type of um, developments. I just actually, the reason I was late, I was at the Historic Zoning Commission's um, budget hearing. So, but um, this is the type of collaboration. Um, oh, but first, is someone from the Historic Zoning Commission here? Just, just left? Okay. Oh, okay. Did you want to? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Did, um, did you want to speak at all maybe about the letter that Tim had written or? Um, well, I, I think what, oh, if I understood from the Historical Commission, the, uh, the main issue was just buildings one, two, and zones one, two, and three. Commissioner, I think we should get her up here to okay. uh, come on up and um, just kind of go through the letter. We appreciate it. We'll put it on record.
My name is Caroline Eller. I'm with the Metro Historical Commission. I'm on staff there. And um, I have come today. I'm a little bit late to the party in terms of um, being involved with this process, but I have been given a copy of our D Executive Director Tim Walker's letter to the Planning Commission. Um, I did want to just do a quick comment, if possible, on the historical properties that would be affected by the proposed development. Um, so this includes Fort Negley, which we all know was National Register listed in 1975, also locally landmarked in 2005, the 8th Avenue Reservoir, which was listed in the National Register in 1978 and locally landmarked in 2004, Rose Park, um, the former site of Fort uh, Morton. Um, the site was also known as Rock Town or New Bethany, New Bethel, and was a freedman's habitation after the war that developed out of a contraband camp loaded, located on the north side of Curry's Hill, um, which is the current location of Rose Park under Fort Morton. Um, so as we've already discussed, the fort sites are historically interconnected, um, designed to be visually, geographically, and geologically related as part of the larger fortification system that formed a ring around Nashville. And um, there are several historical maps. I have brought a few for the commission if you're interested in seeing them that do demonstrate the fort locations, the topography, and the battlefields showing this interrelationship. Um, there are uh, lots of historical photos that confirm the visibility from one site to another and illustrate the importance of these view sheds that we've been discussing. Um, it's important to note that Civil War history is a very distinct connection between these sites, but it, there are larger stories and significance, including the location and construction of the reservoir, as well as the linkage to African American history across these three sites. So view sheds and sight lines are central to the historical importance of the three hills. And therefore, um, I will just read a quick excerpt from our director's letter to the commission in order to preserve the view sheds, building heights within the project area, with the exception of the tower elements and zones five, six, and seven, should be limited to the elevation of the ring road around the reservoir. Prior to final site plan SP approval, MHC staff must review the tower elements to minimize adverse effects to the historic sites. Final review could require additional view shed studies. Thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioner. Okay. Any, any questions for her before she walks home? Okay, thanks. Yeah? What commissioner? Oh, never mind, never mind. Okay, anyway. Uh, you, are you gonna ask her more questions? No, no, no I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, but understanding, you know, the, with these type of projects, it takes com um, compromise is one of the words that was brought up and working together. And so many times a lot of, you know, things are decided without, especially when it reserves, uh, or when it, um, it's about our historic sites. But this is one time that uh, I do feel like there was a collaboration of, of, you know, even Historic Nashville had come with John Summers and, you know, I think a compromise was worked out for the, you know, I think the betterment of the community. So uh, although I do respect and I, I do have concern just like, um, you know, Commissioner Haynes and Commissioner Gobblebrop about, you know, I think it'd be zones one, two, and three that and I'd, I'd like for staff and it by, Tim's letter, I think they're gonna ask for some more review of those few sheds, but it's hard not to be, you know, tell excited about this area and tell excited about, you know, the one for one for replacement, you know, even though I'm not supposed to talk about affordable housing, but uh, <laughs> I didn't talk about it. But anyway, uh, I, I do support this, uh, do support this. Well, and I, I wanna thank Commissioner Tibbs. Chairman Tibbs is really uh, the appropriate name because he spent a lot of his life uh, in pen passion working in preserving historical structures. So thank you for that and thank you for asking those questions and serving as our rep. So we do appreciate that very much. Vice Chair. Um, well, I have a lot of questions about this one. Um, you know, first, I, I definitely, I strongly agree with the idea that density needs to go down 8th Avenue. I mean, that does make sense to me. So from the policy change, um, the first one makes sense to me. I think that's, you know, eventually we'll bring transit back to the picture and I think 8th is an area where we're gonna have a transit line or we'll have transit. So it makes sense that we have some additional um, density along 8th. Um, 
I have worked closely with the park at Hillside for many years. When I first moved to Nashville, I'm almost embarrassed, or I am almost embarrassed to admit, I worked for Bank of America with the CDC, um, overseeing the development of the park at Hillside with the first round of tax credits that they received. Um, at the time, I was right out of graduate school. Um, the conditions that I walked into were horrifying. Um, uh, you know, for better or worse, I'm not at Bank of America anymore. I've been gone for 20 years almost, so, um, but, uh, and I'm not going to defend the way they handled the property for the years afterwards, but I will say we had a local office for about three years that was very closely attached to that property. Once the local office closed and it got absorbed into things that were managed out of Atlanta and Charlotte, I think it's understandable that maintenance declined significantly. So for my former employer of 19 years ago, I do apologize for that. But I have a very strong... Um, commitment to that and have always appreciated that we still had that huge swath of affordable housing in such a desirable area. Um, I know I can't talk about affordable housing, but it, it, that is what it is. It is a 100% affordable housing project right now located in the heart of Nashville. Um, and so I am very grateful to Elmington for preserving that. For my own peace of mind, I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask the applicant um, if, that are about affordable housing that I just would like to have. Well, now, Vice Chair, I'll remind you, you got to be very careful in the line of questioning for affordable housing. Okay. Very can careful. They, can they go into the, with the count for, for the councilman's perspective when the council person? And I, I want to point out condition number five. We worked with Metro Legal on condition number five to try to put as much as we felt was legal based on the, the, the recent state. state legislation that has been passed to address affordable housing. So that's really as far as we're comfortable addressing affordable housing is in condition number five. So, so I have to ask the council person my questions one one on one at a later date. That would that would that would be probably what, that would be much preferable if it gets okay. into specifics beyond what's mentioned in staff report. Otherwise, we put ourselves in a legal predicament of okay. uh, and and putting it putting the project in jeopardy. Okay. So, and and so you can talk to the councilman after, and there's still time to to work on some of that. Okay. If you want to. I will do that. I will okay. follow up with you. I'm 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 sorry. Uh, no. You know we no. really. I, I feel like we have to be very careful, and right. the lawyers have warned me. No, I just in this situation where we are taking <laughs> a project that's entirely yes. affordable housing and well, we are to ten potentially taking all, all right. that affordable housing out of the stock, it's very hard not to want some specifics around that. I so understand. I, I feel like we're going against all of our Nashville next work, but we've been down that path. So yep. I, I guess I can't ask all of my specific questions. Um, you can ask about density. You no, can ask about no, bikes. No. You can ask about. I, I know. <laughs> well, so, okay. Well, one question then, and it doesn't really relate to this, but I am curious how this all has been tied into the planning with Envision Casey. So maybe that's a question for you, Councilman. Like I. Come on yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious, kind of, what the thinking is for this. Well, I'm at this point. I'm going to I'm going to lean on planning as well for that because the a lot of the conversation that I am privy to that ties into Envision Edge has Imagine mostly Edgehill. been about design, um, okay. about how and I'm looking at Pearl cuz um, about how I mean the the line that you see right there is literally says pedestrian walkway. It's the westernmost portion of the property. Um, a lot of the conversation when it comes to tying in with Envision Edge has been how do you restore, you know, that to maybe a little bit more right of a right away? Um, in addition, bringing that street grid across so that you're not creating, whether literal or figurative, a wall between this property and the start of the Envision Edge Hill property. Right. Okay. So. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's exciting um, because there's a lot of opportunity here and a lot of opportunity to do it right. And I think the process that has been started with um, this one with the reservoir definitely indicates that, you know, the neighborhood is cohesive and the neighborhood is, you know, feels like their voice has been heard, I think, for the most part. And hopefully we'll continue to engage in that discussion about making this an inclusive, um, an inclusive effort that really tries to bring together all sectors of a rapidly changing part of our city. Um, so because I can't ask all my questions, um, 
I do think this is an exciting opportunity. I think this is, is an underutilized space as it currently stands. Um, so I think that the plan that's been put in place um, does make a lot of sense, and um, I will support it. And if you'd like, I'll make a motion. That would, oh, in a second, make okay. a motion in a second. Okay. I just want to make one Commissioner? Sure. Yes? Well, if we have oh, you need to turn your mic on. Sorry. Um, I, I want to thank you. Part of my consideration was the fact that you are uh, willing to work on a conservation overlay, which I'll be recusing myself, but thank you. I just want to go on record that you've said that, so thank you very much. Sure. I, I'd, I'd just add to that that I think, again, I know I'm asking a lot of the community. I think we're trying to adhere to Nashville Next as much as we can, and part of that is protecting our interior neighborhoods. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions? We'll need a motion. This would be appropriate motion. Time. All right. Well, I will make a motion that we approve I, uh, item 2A, two A, two A, which is, is the um, my notes are on 2B. two B. Two A is the um, community plan amendment. Is that a motion to second. approve? It's been a motion and second. Any other discussion on item two A? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Two A is adopted. Item two. So, um, commissioners, why don't we? Should we take items 2B and 2C separately just? Yeah, let's do them separately just to keep it clean. And then, um, so we'll need a motion on item 2B. So I'll make a motion that we approve item 2B, which is a specific plan. Uh, staff recommendation. As the staff, staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? second? There's a second. Any other discussion on item 2B, the staff recommendation? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and 2B is adopted unanimously both 2a and 2b uh, item now we're on item 2c we'll need a motion uh, for the uh, pud cancellation yes i will make a motion that we support staff recommendation for the pud cancellation that is a proper motion and is there a second second any other discussion seeing none all in favor of item 2c say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed no ayes have it and that it, item 2c is adopted so we are, um, before we move on, I do want to say thank you to the council member and all of the community members and our own staff. Uh, I think we should give them a round of applause. All right, so we are now, if, uh, or, yeah, if everybody will, uh, we'll get. Y'all enjoy the Preds game. <laughs> Go Preds. We'll be here a little bit longer. Um, we'll let everybody leave and then we'll start on. Commissioners, I think we're, everybody's still okay to continue on to item 11? Okay. Let's, if everybody get settled down and we'll go to item 11. Good afternoon, good afternoon commissioners. My name is Alan Gonzalez and I'll be presenting item 11. Thanks, Alan. We appreciate it. This is to amend the major collective street plan to align with the adopted Haynes Trinity planning study. Staff recommends approval. As you're aware, in response to growing community demand for increased urban amenities and street connectivity, the planning department worked with representatives within the Bordeaux, Whites Creek, Haynes Trinity community, community area to craft a land use study for the neighborhoods along West Trinity Lane between Clarksville Pike to the west and Baptist World Center Drive to the east. Uh, this map highlights the study area that was a part of that, which was recently approved this past January. Uh, Clarksville Pike is over here to the west, the Cumberland River is to the south. Baptist Word Tunnel Drive is to the east, and Mormon's Arm Road is to the north. Following extensive meetings with members of the Community Driven Steering Committee, a four day charrette process, and outreach with approximately 3,500 property owners within and near the study area, the Haynes Trinity Planning Study was approved by the Metro Planning Commission at its January 11th public hearing. 
Uh, the proposed major and collective street plan amendments only align the street character with those changes in land use policy that were part of the, the adopted Haynes Trinity study. Prior to this evening's hearing, planning staff is also coordinated with the Haynes Trinity, Trinity Neighborhood, Asso Neighborhood Coalition and the Nashville North by Northeast Neighborhood Associations to further outline the proposed changes outlined within this amendment. Aside from the pursuit character changes as part of this request, no other changes are proposed at this time. The existing Haynes Trinity adopted plan, uh, uh, this, this map highlights the existing major collection street plan along with the, the proposed 35 changes to the major collection street plan. Overall, there are 21 amendments for streets identified as T3 suburban transit policy. That changes to T4 urban transit policy, which impacts the sidewalk design. Uh, T4, er, T4 transit areas um, have wider sidewalks anticipation for more people walking as in association with m more mixed use development and connectivity to transit. Seven of these proposed changes are for future street connections, which are identified that may occur as a result of private development, uh, which would provide enhanced connectivity to support walkable mixed use to neighborhoods and to future greenways along the Cumberland River. These are located here. Um, they're represented on this map by the purple dotted lines along the Cumberland River, north of Trinity Lane, lying parallel, uh, connecting, uh, connecting Young's Lane to Baptist World Center Drive, and, north, and three north to south connections connecting all three uh, corridors. Four of these amendments also rec are, are planning to upgrade Young's Lane and Cliffs Drive from local streets to collector avenues in order to facilitate the construction of wider sidewalks and improve mobility. Uh, they're identified here, Cliffs Drive and Young's Lane here. There were two amendments there to delete previously approved uh, potential street connections around the Brick Church Office Park and it's identified in this area. Uh, and finally, there's one amendment to downgrade East Nocturne Drive, previously known as a Collector Avenue, down to a local street. Finally, this map identifies what the new MCSP street network would look like should these changes take effect this evening. Uh, and it's, it's important that staff rec recommends approval to this minor housekeeping amendment. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Elwin. We appreciate it. We'll open this item for public hearing. Uh, and uh, and so we're the applicant, uh, obviously. Uh, and so um, we did the presentation. And so what we'll do is we'll go right into uh, residential comments, uh, community comments, if that's OK with everybody. So anyone wishing to speak in support of the of the street program. Anyone seeing none? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Oh, you got to push. There we go, so, ma'am. What are, are you here in, to speak in opposition? No. Oh, in support. Yes. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that first. Go and. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sleeping. You were moving too fast. I'm sleep. I was moving too, way too fast. Uh, so state your name and your address, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joyce George. I live at 711 Work Drive, and I'm a member of the Haynes Trinity Coalition. And uh, we are in support of uh, this amendment. However, we want to uh, be assured uh, that two of the items are uh, maintained, and that is that the new roads will only be built if a developer buys the land and builds on the land. And the developer will be responsible uh, for the cost and construction of the road. And number two is that existing property owners who are not interested in developing will not be required to have the road come through their property and that the city will not use eminent domain to make them do so. Thank you.
Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Uh, I do want to get uh, a legal interpretation of, uh, or a clarification, Bob, of what the plan does. Yeah. This is an update to our major and collector street plan, and this uh, is what guides us when we review zone change applications and subdivision applications. It is not a, uh, it, it is not associated with any sort of construction, but it does guide the city for if the city were to have something in the capital improvement budget or the spending plan, then we would reference this plan in the design of those roads. But this is not a, a plan that. Uh, will go out and be implemented by adoption of the plan. It's just a guide that helps us as we review different cases. All right, legal, do you wanna add anything or no? no I think it's good. Perfect. All right, uh, see, we already closed the public hearing. Uh, Vice Chair, you wanna go first? I have no comments. All right, Commissioner Tibbs. No comments. Well, how about we do this? Anybody, any any comments from any commissioner? Commissioner Bichelle, go ahead. Um, could you clarify then, um, just uh, in response to clearly, in, I mean, to her questions, to the speaker's questions, since this is just a plan, um, there would not be eminent domain um, to cor to construct these streets, correct? I mean, there's currently no plan by the city to construct the streets within this plan. And the uh, people who are currently residing there would not be responsible for paying for the construction of this, um, these streets, correct? That's correct. Okay, so uh, it seems like um, I can't possibly see any reason not to support this. All right, so we'll try that again. Any other commissioners for discussion? Any comments, commissioners? So, how about make a motion, Commissioner? I move to accept this um, staff recommendations to approve um, item 11. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? second? There's a second. Any other discussion? Saying none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, unanimously approved. We are on to item number 19. Abby, thank you. How are you? I'm good. good. All right, you're up. You got to push the middle button. There Can you go. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Item 19 is a request to rezone property on 0 0.47 acres from single family residential to specific plan mixed use zoning at the southwest corner of Dabbs Avenue and 22nd Street uh, to permit all uses under the MULA zoning district except for alternative financial services and waste management uses and also to limit the maximum height. The site is outlined in red um, for context, here is Old Hickory Boulevard, um, and here is the Old Hickory Reservoir, and then DuPont Hadley Middle School is right here. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Um, here is the site, and it includes three parcels which are currently vacant. Here's another view of the site. Uh, here is 22nd Street, um, and then here is the school property. 
The site is currently zoned RS5. Uh, the specific plan mixed use district is intended for residential uses in addition to office uh, and commercial uses. A majority of the surrounding parcels are zoned for mixed use and multifamily development, including um, some residential SPs located across um, the street at 22nd and Dabs. Uses within this SP shall be limited to those uses permitted under MULA, um, except for waste management uses and alternative financial services. Uh, future development is limited to 35 feet in height, uh, measured to the roof line, and um, construction materials shall include at least 50% of uh, brick or masonry on the exterior. Um, prohibited construction materials include EFIS, vinyl siding, and untreated wood. The proposed zone change is consistent with the T4 mixed use neighborhood policy, which is intended to enhance urban neighborhoods by providing a mixture of residential and non-residential uses um, in areas that are envisioned to become primarily mixed use. This site is located in an area of T4 uh, mixed use policy in purple um, that is surrounded by a mixture of other land use policies, including civic, um, open space to the north and east, um, and it transitioning to neighborhood maintenance a few blocks down to the southeast, and then T3 um, mixed-use corridor along Old Hickory, and that policy begins about 450 uh, feet southwest of the site. Um, Nashville Next also identifies Old Hickory um, as a, a, a priority corridor, uh, indicating that this area is appropriate for additional density um, and future growth. Rezoning to RS5 to MULA will allow the site to redevelop in a manner that is consistent with policy and with the surrounding context. Um, and specific standards outlined in the plan will ensure that future development um, is compatible with surrounding land uses. Therefore, staff recommends approval with conditions. Um, I'm sorry, staff recommends approval uh, because the zone change is consistent with policy. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing and is the applicant in the room? Yes. Come on up. And you have 10 minutes and you can reserve uh, two minutes of the 10 for a rebuttal. So please state your name and your address. Uh, my name is Jason Bachman with Twin Team Construction. I'm at 1598 Gill Road. Um, we are proposing a small mixed use development here with a mix of retail and residential units uh, to service the Old Hickory neighborhood and its residents. Uh, the lot, as she mentioned, is currently vacant. There's trash on the lot, there's dead trees, and we're looking to um, improve the area by doing some affordable commercial uh, residential mix to service local business owners. Uh, there's currently uh, a lapse of good commercial and retail space for the Old Hickory and Lakewood area. Um, our team has currently renovated seven um, retail locations within two blocks of this location between Old Hickory Boulevard and the marina in Old Hickory. Um, in advertising and, and renovating those properties, which uh, some of which are older, more historical buildings, such as the Trail of Tears, we've gotten a large influx of business owners and, and local residents who cannot afford to house their businesses in downtown corridors and, and need a more affordable place to uh, start up businesses. Um, with that being said, uh, most of the properties between Old Hickory Boulevard and this location over to the marina uh, are zoned mixed use at this time and there are opportunities for other business owners to come in if this property is developed. Uh, there's also several other uh, residential communities and townhome communities on both opposing corners as well as five other developments within a mile of this area uh, with higher density residential areas um, and, and with the increase of residential uh, dwellings in the area, we feel that uh, some retail would be needed. Uh, and, and this gives it a, a great opportunity for walkability uh, for the residents in the area. 
and um, we, we do plan on having parking on site to alleviate some of the traffic. Um, and we have several business owners who have already inquired um, and have some interest in this site. Um, there has been a community meeting with uh, Mr. Larry Hager, the councilman, and the community. Um, and, and a large amount of people are supporting this idea and would like to see the commercial side and, and retail mix come back to this area. A lot of the current retail in the area is dilapidated or is not operating at its full capacity and we're trying to, to bring a new mix to this area so that the residents of, of the former Lakewood and Old Hickory do not have to travel downtown or to Hermitage or Madison. Um, this gives them some local services and places to um, shop and, and have some dining options other than the marina, which is extremely busy because it is the only real dining area in, in the immediate location. Um, with all that being considered, uh, we have had uh, positive feedback on social media from the local residents. Uh, as long as the building is not a ultra-modern, high-tech um, building that does not fit the area. Uh, as the developer, we are willing to work with the community and come up with something that is a blend of the old and the new that gives you some of the modern conveniences that, that we need in today's society without totally trying to change the character of, of Old Hickory and, and what they are offering at this time. Um, in closing, um, we appreciate feedback from anybody um, and, and we're willing to work with, with the residents to make sure that the development uh, is an improvement for the area and uh, increases the viability for, for the neighborhood. Thank you, sir. We'll reserve two minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishes? And Councilman, do you want to go last? I'll go last. Okay, Council. I want to make sure you're taken care of. So. Uh, anyone wishing to seeing no? Uh, one wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. And state your name and your address, and you thank have you. two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. My name is Geisha Hansman. I live at 1708 Riverside Drive in Old Hickory, about four minutes uh, walking distance from this uh, uh, property. So I'm not here speaking in total opposition of this particular proposed uh, condo that's going to be there. Um, now, uh, and I'm, you know, uh, encouraged by uh, Ms. Bachman's words that he will work with the community when it comes to um, architectural designs of this property, which is basically my biggest concern today, uh, along with one other. So there are already three brand new condominiums across the street from this proposed rezone application address, buildings that are architecturally and visually extremely out of phase with Lakewood's housing landscape, and as well as those in Old Hickory, uh, close to this uh, uh, proposed land. Uh, Old Hickory is almost uh, this year 100 years old, and having brand new condominiums of this uh, nature, it just really don't fit into this uh, close-knit old community. I've lived into this area for about uh, 12 years, and I believe that I have a sense of why people want to live and invest in home in this area, and it really is the beauty and the quiet charm of this uh, not-to-the-past historic part of Nashville. Uh, if this zoning application is approved, we'll have five large condominiums, five large condominiums on this very corner in the middle of, of a community that's almost 100 years old and, and obviously reflects that uh, old, old architecture. Um, if the proposed building uh, will look like anything like the three existing that now are just have just been built uh, across from this proposed location, this area will literally look like a modern downtown, and uh, we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to preserve Old Hickory and, and Lakewood, and they really would be in stark contrast to the other properties in the vicinity, including historic homes in Old Hickory um, that are on the historic registry. Um, so in closing, I would like to say, uh, I'd like to ask the commission to, or the, or the planner to defer this application until uh, the commission has the uh, chance to measure the impact of this development on the housing landscape of the, of the uh, 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 housing landscape of uh, Old Hickory and Lakewood, and basically assure that the architectural plans are in tune and in sync with this old community. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. you coming down. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Councilman, you want to go? I didn't see anybody. Welcome, Council. Larry Hager, District 11 Council District. I live at 108 Cherry Branch Lane. Um, I know full well about the Centennial. I've been working on that for a whole year. I'm going to leave these for y'all to come join us. 
on June the 2nd for the centennial. We're going to have a parade and all kinds of things going up on Hadley. Uh, and you'll have a great time. We're going to have bands. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to have all kinds of things going on. So y'all really enjoy this. Let me start. We had a community meeting about this particular piece of property. Um, what's unique about this area? This is the old Lakewood city area. And years ago, Lakewood had a proposal in that area that 22nd all the way down to the uh, boat dock for the most part was going to be small type of businesses and commercial. When metropolitan government came in and took that over, then most of all that property down through there was zoned MUL. So the vision back when Lakewood was still incorporated was that was going to be a corridor to go from Oiku Boulevard all the way down to the boat dock uh, with commercialization, small businesses, uh, CS type zoning. That developer that came in there to do that, for some reason it fell apart and it was never done. So when we bring this back up, we look at that same vision that Lakewood had at one time to take that area on 22nd and all the way down to Oakwood Boulevard and make it a corridor to the uh, Blue Turtle Bay boat dock. What's unique about this particular area, many of you have been to other boat docks in the area, or I've got property in Panama City and I go to the boat dock in Panama City, uh, is the shopping that's around this particular boat dock. You go to other boat docks around Percy Priest Lake or around Old Hickory Lake, there is no shopping. So what's unique about this is that you can go over there and shop at these different type of shops around there, then you can go down to the boat dock, you can eat at Sam's or you can get on your boat and drive off, or you can come by boat over to this area, park your boat, walk up the street and go shopping. That's what's nice about it. Um, the other choice was to leave it RS5. When we had the meeting about this, the gentleman to the left of this property uh, has a uh, machine shop. And he even asked me, you know, down the road if he could do that as well. And so he's already zoned a commercial type service because he's a machine shop. He's been there probably 30 years as a machine shop. So what we're looking at is this morphing into the area that Lakewood had a vision a long time ago about. Now, um, know Mr. Joe Henderson very well, nice guy. Uh, he contacted me about this. And when you talk about protection of this area, Oh Hickory, um, I have a, I came to y'all before, and I put a contextual overlay in the Oh Hickory Village area. Uh, that was probably about two years ago. Uh, most of the people there did not want historical zoning, uh, so we went with a contextual overlay. And that contextual overlay has done what it's supposed to do. It's preserving all the old houses that are approximately 100 years old, uh, and they're still there and they're intact under this contextual overlay. Lakewood uh, had meetings offering them a contextual overlay, uh, but they didn't want it. So we don't want a contextual overlay. So I said, fine. Um, so. That's kind of the difference in this particular area, and then when you go over to Riverside Drive and to the uh, <coughs> west of this particular area, because that used to be the old Lakewood City area. When we had the community meeting, we did some things on this MULA for restrictions as to what type of business it could go there. We restricted the height to 35 feet, and then we did the uh, brick, 50% mason or brick. The other condos on that other corner that's to the, kind of to the east of that, that are being built now, they're fairly modern looking, but they were in the same situation. Uh, that was an SPMUL, and we did restrict them on uh, type of building materials and the height that they could put there. Uh, and, and that's what's there now. They are fairly modern looking, but they do have the uh, material that we told them to do. So. So far, what I've seen is that people in this area want small businesses. They want, they're starving for small business to come into this area. And as he said earlier, the businesses on Oakley Boulevard, which are the old historic buildings that have been there for 50 years, are already basically MULAs. They've got apartments up above them, two blocks down the road facing Oakley Boulevard. So we, took the position that we thought this was a good plan 
and I've talked to the developer and he's gave me some plans as to the facade of these buildings and he's going to try to keep the historical nature of our area intact and we, we ask for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And does the applicant want two minutes rebuttal? Are you good? Okay. We'll declare it. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go first? Um, I, especially after the councilman's um, discussion about this area, I'm um, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I know um, maybe some other questions about there. It was an ambitious amount of things that were talked about that were going to go there. It, I would like to, you know, be interested to see how that all what all actually ends up going there. But I think in principle, I don't have any problems with it. Commissioner Bichelle. I don't have a comment. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, no Commissioner Sims. Haynes. No Haynes. Vice Chair, you want to make a motion? Sure. If you don't, if you don't have any comments. I, I, I don't. I, I second Commissioner Tibbs that it's a small site for everything I heard, but I trust that that will be figured out as this moves forward. Um, I will make a motion that we approve staff recommendation to <coughs> approve this project. Project. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. 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 Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the staff recommendation say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Unanimous. And we are on item. Thank you for coming down, Councilman. Appreciate it. I'll leave these here too for y'all. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sounds like family fun. We are on item 22. Abby, you're up again. <laughs> All right, item 22 uh, is a request for a concept plan approval to create five lots on 3.56 acres located at 3700 Woodlawn Drive, uh, north of the terminus of Limbrook Road um, and the RS20 single family residential zoning district. The site is located mid block between Wilson Boulevard over here and Bowling Avenue to the east. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. As a reminder, um, this case was deferred um, at the April 12th Planning Commission meeting. Um, and after the meeting, the applicant submitted plan revisions to address some public works and stormwater comments. Um, these changes were minimal and did not affect the overall uh, concept or layout, uh, but the uh, May 10th staff report was updated uh, to reflect uh, those changes. Um, the revised plan is consistent with the original layout um, and staff's recommendation of disapproval um, remains unchanged. Um, I also want to mention that at the April 12th meeting, um, staff was asked to clarify existing entitlements at the site. Um, so there are two parcels right now. Um, they are both eligible um, for single family homes. So each lot could have a single family home on it. Um, as far as uh, development entitlements, those are derived from zoning and what would be permitted under by the subdivision regulations. The site is located uh, on two existing parcels. Uh, the larger parcel contains an existing residence uh, over here, and the smaller parcel is vacant. Um, uh, the larger, the home here is shown to be retained and included on one of the lots proposed for subdivision. Here is the site as it relates to the entire block face. Uh, Wilson Boulevard is over here. Uh, Bowling Ave Avenue is over here. Um, all lots will be accessed from Lynbrook Road, which is an existing road um, on the opposite side of Woodlawn. The site is zoned RS20. You'll notice that the Woodlawn block face um, contains this, this portion of Woodlawn is zoned RS20. Um, these properties were down zoned a couple of years ago from R, uh, R20 to RS20. Um, additional properties on and around Woodlawn have uh, recently been down zoned to single family zoning districts uh, in recent years. You'll notice that this, this portion of Woodlawn contains larger lots on both sides of the street. 
Properties to the north and northwest are primarily zoned one and two family residential up here. And then properties to the east and south are primarily zoned uh, for single family uh, residential. The site is located in neighborhood maintenance policy suburban, which is intended to preserve the general character of developed residential neighborhoods. Staff does not find uh, this proposal to be in keeping with the surrounding area. <coughs> The proposed plot would create five lots, ranging from approximately 20,000 square feet to 27,000 square feet. All lots would be accessed from a new public street, Limbrick Road, um, which, would be, which would align with the existing Limbrick Road across the street. Um, proposed lot five, as I mentioned before, uh, contain, contains an existing residence, um, which is indicated to be retained with this subdivision. This slide shows how the proposed lots would, um, and new road, relate to the Woodlawn um, Drive block face. Again, here is Wilson, here is Bowling, and then here are the five um, new lots and the new loop road. Section 3-5.2 of the subdivision regulations requires that newly uh, newly created lots in neighborhood maintenance areas that are predominantly um, subdivided, predominantly developed and subdivided must be comparable to surrounding lots. The proposed lots meet the minimum requirements of the RS-20 zoning district um, and um, all proposed lots will have uh, frontage along a public street. Section 3-5.2.D um, requires that newly created lots in areas that are previously subdivided and developed um, must be comparable to the surrounding lots in regards to frontage, area, setback, and orientation. Surrounding parcels is defined in the subdivision regulations as the 5R, RS, AR2A, or AG parcels oriented to the same block face on either side um, of the parcel proposed for subdivision or to the end of the uh, same block face, whichever is less. In this instance, uh, proposed lots one and five, which are shown in yellow, um, are located along an existing street, Woodlawn Drive, and then lots two, three, and four um, on the back are located along a new street, Linbrook. Um, therefore, only lots one and lots five uh, are re reviewed against the compatibility criteria for infill subdivisions. The surrounding parcels used in this analysis are shown in light purple. Um, since the new public street, Limbrick Road, uh, introduces a new block face, um, the surrounding parcels used to determine compatibility for lot one are different than those used to determine compatibility for lot five. Beginning with lot frontage, the lots must have frontage either equal to or greater than 70% of the average frontage or of surrounding parcels, or equal to or greater than the surrounding lot with the least amount of frontage. Along Woodlawn Drive, lot, lot one must have frontage either equal, um, at least equal to 112.1 feet, and lot five must have frontage at least equal to approximately 123.69 feet. Uh, proposed lot one has 144.5 feet of frontage and lot five has 154.5 feet of frontage. And so both of the proposed lots meet compatibility requirements for frontage. Um, moving on to lot area, which is uh, analyzed in the same manner, the proposed lots must have a total area e uh, either equal to or greater than 70% of the average area of surrounding parcels or equal to or greater than the surrounding lot with the, me the least amount of area, whichever is greater. Along Woodlawn Drive, um, lots one and five, which again are highlighted in yellow, um, are, are are uh, reviewed against the area requirements. Lot one must be at least approximately 35,980 feet, and lot five must be at least approximately um, 37, sorry, um, 37,301 square feet. Lot one is approximately 29,547 square feet, and lot five is approximately 27,660 square feet. Neither of the proposed lots meet uh, compatibility requirements for area. Again, this shows the relationship between lot one and the surrounding parcels to the west, and lot five and the surrounding parcels to the east. 
Uh, for street setbacks, the subdivision regulations tell us that when the minimum required street setback is less than the average of this street setback of the two par parcels abutting either side of the lot proposed to be subdivided, a minimum building setback line shall be included on the proposed lots at the average setback. In this instance, the minimum required street setback per zoning for lot one is 120 feet. Uh, the average street setback of abutting parcels is approximately 133.7 feet, which is greater than 120 feet. Uh, therefore, lot one must include a minimum building setback line of approximately 133.7 feet, which has been identified on the plat. A uh, minimum building setback line is not required to be platted for lot five since the existing structure and existing front setback uh, will be retained. However, uh, future, set, uh, future structures would have to comply with the setbacks as established by the Metro Zoning Code. Finally, uh, both lots are consistent with the orientation of surrounding parcels and um, all reviewing agencies have not recommended approval of this application. Based on the subdivision regulations definition of surrounding parcels, lot one and five do not meet the area requirements uh, of surrounding lots. Lot one is approximately 6,433 square feet less than required, and lot five is approximately 9,641 feet, square feet uh, less than the required size based on surrounding parcels. The applicant requests approval under section 3-5.2 of the subdivision regulations, which states that if a proposed subdivision fails to meet the compatibility criteria, the commission may grant an exception to the compatibility requirement by considering whether the subdivision can provide for the harmonious development of the community. The applicant has proposed to meet this harmonious development prov provision by limiting vehicular access to a maximum of 16 feet, um, a 16 foot wide driveway located between the primary structure and the street and also requiring raised foundations for all residential structures. The Woodlawn uh, Drive block face is unique in that it contains predominantly larger lots that have generally remained intact as compared to surrounding blocks with smaller lots. This, the, this pattern of development would change the character of this section of Woodlawn Drive. The Planning Commission may grant an exception to the compatibility criteria by considering a larger area to evaluate uh, compatibility, the general compatibility, if they find it appropriate. Um, however, staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Thank you, Abby. Uh, is the applicant here? Applicant? As the applicant, you have 10 minutes, and Thanks. you know that you can do two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. We are going to ask Welcome. that again. Welcome. I'm David Kleinfelter with Reno and Kavanaugh. Sorry you have to send me twice in one night, and we do ask for two minutes. Real quick, we want to say we, we've never made any statements about the 16 foot. We don't have a problem with the 16 foot, but I th we saw that in the staff report and assumed it got copied over from some other staff report because we, we've never said this only got one road. There's no primary street or raised foundations. I'm not really sure where that came from in the staff report, but I mean, Nobody on our side's ever proposed anything like that. We believe it's harmonious. Um, Tom Pennington is going to speak first. Uh, he's obviously the family name. His, um, uh, the family, the property was owned is owned by the Pennington estate. Ms. Pennington died a little while, a year or so ago, and she owned the three and a half acres. And then Hunter G is going to explain the plan and why we believe it meets the harmonious uh, development criteria. Thank you, Mr. Pennington. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I'm Tom Pennington. Uh, I, I am a son and heir to Phyllis and Gov Pennington, who lived on the property for over 40 years. And I am also a, uh, a, a resident of District 24 and a constituent of Councilmember Murphy. I uh, live at 202 Craighead Avenue uh, in, in District 24. Um, you know, I had the great privilege to grow up on that property and experience firsthand the benefits of living on what amounted to a private country club with tennis court, swimming pool, pool house, the works. Uh, my parents enjoyed it immensely. Uh, it is a huge burden to maintain and not inexpensive. And with my mother's passing two years ago, it became apparent that uh, the highest and best use of the property was not as a single residence. So we began to look into developing it into a more efficient uh, residential configuration 
employed some highly qualified uh, professionals who will address the technical details. Uh, we attended a number of community meetings, uh, one concerning the down zone from R20 to RS20, to which we consented, and, and, and to which we had at one point hoped to uh, get approval for an SP, but it became apparent that there was no appetite for discussing anything outside of strict compliance with RS20. So what we have developed are, are, are plans that are strictly compliant with RS20. Uh, I understand there's going to be some discussion about subregs and the application of compatibility regulations, although I am informed that there is an alternative plan that is or can be made to uh, uh, fully comply with all of the uh, compatibility uh, requirements, the strict numerical requirements. We just don't think it looks as good. It doesn't have the same open spaces, but again, the experts are going to talk to you about that. I can't uh, really address it competently. Um, with that said, you know, the family has worked hard, spent a lot of money with good professionals to develop a plan that is consistent with what we are accustomed to dealing with as, as Woodlawn Drive, and we, we urge the commission to, plan, to, to approve the plan. Thank you. Thank you for coming down, sir. Appreciate it. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name's Hunter G. I'm with Smith G. Studio. We're architects and planners. Been working with the Penningtons for about a year and a half now on this. Um, I think this is the first time we've ever come before you with a recommendation of disapproval from staff, but I guess there's a uh, first time for everything. But I'm going to explain a little bit how um, there's somewhat of a um, just a fine line between where we are and, and how staff feels about um, how, whether we've met the subdivision regs or not. So over the last 18 months, um, we've worked on uh, several different looks at this and have met with the community uh, three times with uh, the council lady. And the first plan that we took to the community was eight units on six lots. And again, as Tom mentioned, this was intended to be, it wasn't going to be an SP because it uh, had duplexes and it had a little more density than the zoning would allow. Uh, the set, so we, what we heard there was no duplexes, so we came back with six units on six lots. Um, and from that meeting still there was concerns and it became clear at that point that we needed to, that the community really wanted us to stick within the existing zoning. And so we went back to the drawing board and brought this plan to a third meeting in, um, in March of this year. And um, there were two major issues outside of obviously just concern about developing this property, um, and I'm sure we'll hear some of those things tonight, but um, that we heard were stormwater issues, uh, which uh, we'll talk about briefly, and tall skinnies, sort of the concern about developing this into tall and skinnies, and I'll, or you know, small lots, tall skinnies. So um, the goal for this plan was to create a plan that meets the existing zoning uh, and, and is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Um, the property is uniquely situated along Woodlawn uh, in between several of the largest lots uh, along that street. So I'll touch on that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but um, so I have some slides that I was hoping they could pull up. So on the plan, the staff did a great job uh, working with us. We appreciate it. and. Um, and appreciate their patience with us through this whole process. So as, as you can see, there's two lots along Woodlawn now, um, currently existing today. We also have two lots in our uh, plan, which was really important to us to keep that character and the rhythm across of, um, of the street uh, consistent with what was there now. Um, all the lots meet the zoning regs, as mentioned before. The front lots are, are, are really the only two issues here. Everything else meets the regs. And the only thing that we're talking about here that doesn't meet the regs is the compatibility measure, the metric. Um, we're aligning the street. Uh, we're meeting with, uh, we're meeting Metro standards for the street, for public streets. We're meeting all, we will meet all of Metro stormwater regs. Um, setbacks, uh, we'll be able to meet those as mentioned by staff. Uh, and each um, lot will have, each lot here will have access to this new street. So we don't have to have any more driveways on Woodlawn, which we think is a real benefit to Woodlawn as we know there's a lot of traffic on it. Um, Okay, so let me keep going here and hopefully not run out of time and save a little bit of time. So, as you know and as mentioned, there's two methods that you can consider to look at the, sub, to look at the compatibility. And uh, let me back up. 
I'm showing this because this is some of the new information that came before you, or that was gonna come before you two meetings ago, and it's the reason we deferred because we had some new information in our slides and we, want, we wanted staff to be able to review those. So the plan on the left is our plan. The plan on the right is a sketch that represents, um, and we've submit, we submitted um, a similar sketch to planning, represents that it is possible to meet the compatibility regulations uh, on this property, the, the metrics, the pure, the pure metrics. So that was the purpose of that, and we submitted that uh, to the staff. So as you know, there's two methods. One uh, is strict metrics. Um, the other is uh, harmonious development. And for any of those of you who were on the commission, when we put in place the infill regs, um, we specifically talked about this second method. It was, it was extremely important because we understood that there are places within neighborhoods where if you just looked at five lots on one side or five lots on the other, um, there may, you may be in a pocket where there's, where there's some big lots. And so it was really important that we were able to say, hey, there's gotta be another way. If you look at the larger community and the character of the neighborhood, what, you know, what, what is the character of the community? And so that's why you're allowed to use the, the harmonious uh, development method. So I mentioned uh, some concern. We'll go ahead to the next slide. Those are really hard to see, uh, but I know there was some concern about scale and size and tall skinnies. Um, the two frontage lots are 154 feet and 145 feet, I believe. That's half a football field each. So these are large lots. These are half acre lots in the back and uh, two third acre lots in the front. So these are still very large lots. The next slide showed us some character imagery of some of the um, this is actually the builder that we're talking to that may purchase the property, Focus Builder, South Argo. He's built beautiful, uh, beautiful homes throughout Green Hills, million dollar plus homes. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to point out that, um, and I don't want to get confused things too much, but it is important, and it's the reason why we're bringing this plan and not a cul-de-sac plan that, that could, could meet the, the uh, metrics, is that the subdivision regs recommend over a cul-de-sac. Cul-de-sacs are allowed, but, they're, but recommend over that it's preferred to do what's called a close. So that's exactly what we've planned here. Last slide, and I've got to save at least 30 seconds for David. So 84% of the properties in the area uh, do not meet the compatibility criteria as calculated because we're, we've got these large lots around us. Next slide. We looked at it a different way along Woodlawn. 70% of the properties fronting Woodlawn also don't meet that, so I'll reserve the last 20 seconds, and I'm sorry. Thank you, 20 seconds. All right, anyone? Anyone, anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up, welcome, and uh, state your name and your address, and you'll have two minutes. Appreciate you coming down. Good evening. My name is Rob Stein. My wife and I have lived at uh, 3611 Woodlawn Drive for 27 years. Two years ago, the Planning Commission approved a zoning change that was enacted to help preserve the unique character of the Woodlawn Drive corridor that we're discussing this evening. That was done with overwhelming local support. It was done in anticipation of exploitative development that might transform this lovely and well-maintained neighborhood. The current proposal not only doesn't conform to current zoning standards, as mentioned, but most significantly is incongruous with the entire adjacent corridor. Nowhere from Bowling to Estes is there any double stacking of homes that this proposal would enable. The proposal tries to use the ploy of calling a driveway a street that would then enable them to double stack homes. However, the perception of this property from anyone driving along Woodlawn Drive would be quite clear. It is double stacking and bears no resemblance to other adjacent properties in this area. Following this logic, my neighbor and I could create a common driveway, call it Woodlawn Court, and build houses in our current backyards. There are several properties along this corridor that might do the same. This is what we are trying to prevent. 
Approval of this proposal potentially opens the door to the slippery slide of further exploitative development and ultimately erosion of property values in our entire neighborhood, not just along Woodlawn Drive. The Penningtons have stated that they've invested in drawing up the current plans presented. What they haven't invested in is the neighborhood. They don't live here. They have no plans to live here. Had they been willing to accept fair market value for their property and work within current zoning guidelines that would permit three home development, none of us would be here. We might be at the Preds game. We like our unique neighborhood the way it's currently configured and hope that you will agree to maintain it in that way. The, the planning staff has recommended disapproval of the current proposal and I would urge the commission to reject it as well. I thank you for your consideration, for your service to our community. Go Preds. Thank you, thank you sir. Come on up, welcome. Hello, I'm Clint Lane. I live at 3609 Woodlawn Drive. And thank you very much for the explanation, the full explanation of what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, this particular property, when you look at it and you go down up and down Woodlawn, there are very large lots and they're very stately homes that face Woodlawn. Um, I think three lots, that, that two parcel property, if it was made into three lots and, and three homes would be very appropriate. If, if you take their drawing and you take a look at it, it does not look like anything else on Woodlawn. And for that reason, I'm against it, and I, I hope you vote against it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Come on up. We're the Sussmans. I'm Craig Sussman. My wife, Diane, Diane Sussman. Sussman. 3615 36. Woodlawn Drive. <laughs> I bought, we bought that house. 35 years ago. And for the reason uh, that the property was a tree-lined residential stately street with not a lot of homes on it. Um, and we're just concerned that the way Nashville seems to be going with little regard to existing properties and existing um, ways we had are just ruining what we what we treasured for so long so. we there are many neighborhoods that are trying to preserve the architecture think of bell mead links which i know is a separate district but the whole concept is that they want to maintain the architectural feel the area going down natchez trace the new natchez trace is trying to preserve the architecture of their neighborhood the architecture on our street is variable, but it's really like an arboretum. We have, there are necessities in neighborhoods that you want to preserve. And having lots that are tree lined, basically we are wood lawn. We are wooded lawns in the neighborhood of Nashville. We're not trying to be anything like Bell Mead, but we're trying to just maintain a very unique area. All of the neighbors on our blocks have worked very hard. We've worked, for, we've actually been very well organized for 10 to 15 years. And we feel very strongly that there's a necessity to preserve small areas of Nashville that have an appearance that with trees and homes and not stacking. We're also giving up I'm sorry, we're giving up, in many ways people think we're giving up value on our property because we're expecting less value. To, I mean, we're, we think in the long run it would have greater value, but we don't want our estates to be broken up either. Thanks, y'all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Come on up. Thanks. Well, I'm Bunny Porter Shirley, and I didn't anticipate speaking, but listening to this, I thought I had to. I live on Limbrook Road, and I use Limbrook every day, and getting on to Woodlawn. State your address, ma'am. Oh, 801 Limbrook Road. And getting on to Woodlawn is really a challenge many times, and so increasing the density, I think, is an issue people haven't addressed. The other thing, we have such a great, diverse neighborhood. And I look at Woodlawn Park and what the people in our area have been able to build in our, with our community spirit, to, and we haven't asked the city. I mean, we've really worked together as a community to build that. And 
I look at the plan and I go, that street, what they want to extend as Limbrook Road, really isn't Limbrook Road. It's another kind of road. And then how those people are also going to try and access Woodlawn, I think, is another issue when we're talking about density and traffic. Thank you. And you did do an excellent job presenting it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak? And then, uh, council. yeah, the council will go after the, uh, the, yeah. So you have 20 seconds. Go, three points. Uh, if it's three lots, it'd be 50,000 square feet. That's way over 20,000 square feet. Please look at it. There's two lots today. There will be two lots with this project. Please look at that map that shows the lots. They are harmonious with the overall neighborhood. Hanover, all these different things. It's just uniquely situated. This is what the harmonious development provision is for. 30,000 square feet each on the front two lots is what you would have anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to stop. I thought. No, you're good. Thank you. Council lady. Welcome. Thank you. I haven't been in front of y'all for a little bit. I know you want me to just take plenty of time to get to know you again. Um, no, I will, um, this, this case was before y'all, I guess last month, and I had terrible food poisoning, and so Councilman Cooper was here, um, and I know that he's at the budget meetings tonight and why he's not here tonight, um, and he's got District 1 to handle. So one reason that we kind of asked for the deferral last time and, and uh, the development team and family agreed as well was they did call me the day before with the when they put up the two plans saying that they had another plan and which is why one of the reasons why we wanted to ask staff to kind of reconfirm what type of development would just be approved um, without a variance or with a variance and that kind of thing and I think again tonight um, Mr. Kleinfelter kind of opened up their statements with that there was a little bit more confusion about their plan and so I don't know if if I can ask the staff to kind of clarify some of that now, or if you'd rather do that after I speak, um, I'm happy to do either way, to either continue speaking or to have them clarify before I continue. You can clarify. Yeah, what, we can clarify. Why don't we, Lucy? I think that's very appropriate. It's very appropriate. Um, okay, well, so a minor clarification first. Um, the Ray's Foundation, um, condition that we included was on the site plan and so that's why we assumed that it was part of the proposal so it was actually part of the applicant's package so um, that's a minor thing um, the second is there are so there's the plan before us today which has five lots and a close and you've got a recommendation from the staff on the infill compatibility requirements so looking at the front two lots um, we did not evaluate the second plan in detail because it was not um, sort of specifically before us and submitted, but we did look at it. Um, I think there is a possibility that it could meet one set of the subdivision requirements for the infill standards. Um, however, there are a number of other standards that we would look at related to cul-de-sacs and the like. So what I would imagine if that were the plan before you is we would be looking at whether or not um, a cul-de-sac at this location promoted harmony along this block. And so we look at the subregs holistically, I would say. And so there are a number of different sections that we would evaluate. The compatibility requirements is one. Does that? I think that clarifies some okay. of some of it. Thank you. And so something that I wanted to point out that, that I heard staff say tonight that I hadn't really thought of before, and when they put up um, one of the images of the of the where you see the, the lots divided out, is that when they're doing the lot compatibility, they're comparing lot five and lot one to the lots to either side, not along this block face, because the new um, close divides this into two blocks. And I think that's important to bring up, and I hadn't really thought about it before tonight and watching the presentation, because right now we're talking about compatibility on a block face when we're doing the contextual setbacks, when we talk about contextual set plans, the street rhythm and pattern and all these wonderful things that planning has taught me over the past two and a half years in office is that you want the compatibility along that block face. And this is a neighborhood maintenance policy like most of my district. And what's interesting is, again, that this 
breaks up this block into two separate blocks. Um, I think right there, that is not in going with the neighborhood uh, maintenance policy. And so when you're looking at that, and I've got how many neighbors here, if y'all will raise your hand against, that are against this, I know a number have emailed you as well. I just cannot support this, and I have to ask you not to support it as well. Um, the downzoning of this block and the block adjacent to it going down to Estes, from Wilson to Estes, was before y'all, I guess two years ago, a year and a half ago. And all of that came from a BZA case where at the corner of Estes and Woodlawn, we had a property that most neighbors didn't realize was still zoned. Um, I think it was R15 or R10, something along that line. And so we went to the Board of Zoning Appeals to fight the contextual setback. And at that time, we were looking at that block face, and um, the the applicant or the developer was saying that we needed to throw out the anomaly, which was actually Councilman Cooper's house because his setback was too far. Uh, and so it was a really interesting kind of back and forth and discussion about what does contextual setback and what do you look at in a neighborhood when you're trying to decide what is the character of the neighborhood. And I know y'all have, some of y'all have heard the story because I've said it every time we came here to downzone the street. Um, but what was, what the BZA found is that you don't throw throw out um, that outlier simply because it's an outlier. It's on the block face. It, it makes up the character of the neighborhood. And something that Councilman Mendez said at that BZA hearing that stuck out to me and, and is, I think, hopefully going to stick out to y'all too, is when you drive down Woodlawn, um, the character that strikes you of the neighborhood is that they are very big lots and they have lots of trees and that they're deep. And if you look at this, it's going to, you know, from, as the applicants argue, from the street, they think that it's harmonious and, and comparable to what is around and is in other parts of the neighborhood, but you will no longer see the deep setback lots with lots of trees. It will be broken up. It does change the character of this block face. And so um, I just wanted to kind of touch on that point. And let me go over my other notes and see if I've got anything else. Um, I think also was mentioned by the applicant, the highest and best use for this property. Um, and I think that what you've heard my neighbors, um, the other neighbors that live along the street argue, that while this might be the highest and best use in, in the property owner's opinion for this property, other neighbors surrounding it feel that it is going to diminish the highest and best use of their property. And so I think when you're considering all of our policies and the subdivision regulations, you need to take that into effect too, is the effect on the other properties. Um, and so that will conclude my statements. I ask for you all to uh, disapprove this. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I appreciate it. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll close the public hearing. And Commissioner Sims, do you want to go first? I always try to take turns. Uh, first of all, I just need a, a clarification. I think Mr. Stein said that as it is, this could have three homes on it and still stay within the subregs staff. Is that correct? And looking at uh, the subregs and looking at the area and frontage requirements that we would evaluate, um, you could get uh, three lots and meet the frontage. Um, you could get four and meet area, but okay. with area and frontage, the max would be three. Okay. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank uh, Councilwoman Murphy for your, uh, um, a lot of people in the city think you're one of the best there is, and so I take to heart what you say. Thank you. Commissioner uh, <clears throat> A quick question, uh, this may be for Hunter. What is the topography like in this area? Is this, I'm trying to, I think I know where it is, but I'm not totally maybe, sure. Uh, the photo, maybe the photographs of the site, I know they're hard to see in our slides. I don't know if the staff had any. And it's rolling, uh, as best I would describe. Does it slow it down the from the street? Know, know that best, but. Um, right, sloping away from, away from the street. And of course, with subdivision regs, and I know Jennifer is here from Stormwater, she could address, we'll have to meet all the subdivision right. regs, which as you know, are pretty strict now. And we'll actually make the stormwater issue uh, better later than it is today. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I kind of like what they're doing, but I'm having a hard time over ruling. I think the staff's put a lot of work into this. And 
I'm kind of leaning toward the professionals on that. Sorry. Commissioner Morton. Um, I think I'm kind of at the same place and looking at that and then listen to the council lady's comments about maintaining the character and, and with the street creating a whole two different blocks and thinking about maintenance that kind of stood out to me. Um, so at this point I'm inclined to support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Michelle. Um, I, I kind of confused about it because um, the way it is right now, someone could build a house on that smaller lot. And um, with this new plan, that smaller lot actually gets slightly bigger than it is now. And so that, in fact, what would really be on Woodlawn would actually be um, more in keeping with the houses on that block than if someone just bought that little lot and built a house on it right now, which would already be in compliance. Is that correct? So the smaller parcel is a legal lot, so somebody could build on it uh, right now. Um, the larger parcel um, is much bigger, and so right now you could get one on the smaller lot, and then the existing house on the larger parcel could be retained. I think the introduction of a road with three additional lots in the back, you know, may um, may have a different feel than just building a house on the smaller lot, a house on, on the larger lot, and having that green space in between. But uh, it, it would also be in full compliance, um, you, were, you were saying before, so if that larger lot was divided in two and you put two separate houses on there, then what you would have then is three driveways going on to Woodlawn Drive, right? So just to clarify, um, we didn't do an assessment of what the size of the home would be if you were to build on the the lot, the smaller lot to the left, I forget what the number is, so the small lot, versus what the size of the home would be in that same location if you compared it to the larger plan. So I don't, I don't know how large of a difference that would be. Um, to clarify what Abby mentioned to Commissioner Sims's question was, um, you could get three homes that faced Woodlawn Drive and meet frontage and area and four homes facing Woodlawn Drive would only meet one of the criteria. So we were just addressing simply, if you were orienting to Woodlawn, what, how would you meet the regulations? And so I would anticipate that likely the drives would be on Woodlawn. If under that, I think, I'm, I think what I'm hearing you ask is under that scenario, would the drives be on Woodlawn? And the answer is yes, like any of the other homes on that block face I today. Guess does that make, does that answer your question? Not, not totally. Okay. I guess if the if the people who own the those both those lots right now just got sick of all this and sold the smaller lot, someone could just build a house on that lot as it is right now. And that lot would actually be smaller than the lot that they're proposing in their new plan for that lot number one. Lot number one gets bigger in the new plan than it is currently. Is, is that correct? I'm not sure it is. Commissioner Michelle, uh, what we would have to do, what we feel comfortable with in commission is if, if that, if there is a new plan to build a smaller on the smaller lot and then another one beside it, we would still need to review that particular plan. You know, because we say, you know, well, what if this, what if that? We would need time to, the staff would need time to review it. Um, you know, potentially. It could. So, the I hear other Bob has something else to add. Okay. Maybe like clarify. Well, the, I mean, I, I, I haven't compared the lot size of the proposed lot to the existing lot, but but this is a subdivision application that's in front of us that we have to review based on the subdivision regulations. There, there may be some scenario where they could build on the existing lot, but that's not what's before the commission right now, and so we have to review this plan that's in front of us against the regulations and. and make a decision on this plan. So uh, I'm a little uh, hesitant to go down the path of looking at 
the, the lots that are there compared to what they're proposing because that's not really what's being considered. I guess that for me, um, what we're talking about is what is already within zoning now, what is their right already to build on that? And we're comparing this new subdivision to what would already be in their right. So I'm just, I understand that the neighbors want to make sure that this keeps in keeping with everything along um, Woodline, but I'm also thinking about how it seems to me like they have made a very careful plan to try to keep it in keeping with Woodline. I do understand the point about turning it into two separate blocks, but I also understand that if they split even that bigger lot into two separate lots, you'd still have three different driveways along Woodline. So for me, it, it seems that you could make this be in compliance if you extended the area that you're measuring, um, as was even suggested in the staff report, that um, you could extend the area measured and you could then see that, in fact, further down on Woodline, you have much smaller lots with smaller um, facing um, setbacks. And even further on the other side, you also have a plot 196, which wasn't actually included in the calculation. So. Uh, to me, I respect what the council lady said, um, and I understand that um, people in the neighborhood are opposed to breaking up this lot, but the logic escapes me a little bit, and so I right now feel conflicted about it. Commissioner Tibbs? I kind of bounced around um, a little bit um, initially, and then I did uh, appreciate the, the level of thought that went into it from the, the, the design development team. However, um, it does feel like, and I drive down the street and walk down the street when my wife pulls me along, but I do, uh, <laughs> it is a, um, I, it would change it. It would change it this way, I think. I mean, they're, you know, on this straight, uh, you know, this type of turnaround is just not part of it. So um, I'm, I'm, I feel like I still uh, agree with the uh, staff recommendations to dis disapprove it as it is uh, presented. Commissioner Haynes. Jessica gone? Yeah, she is. She, she, she left the Preds game? <laughs> yeah. Uh, she not said no she comment. Know, she's not. No, she's not at the Pritzky. Um <laughs> I drive by this house all the time, understand this. I completely agree with Council Lady Murphy and staff's uh, analysis. I think this would alter the neighborhood, um, so I would move approval of staff's recommendation. So that's a proper motion to move staff recommendation, which is disapproval. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? Aye. One no. And it is disapproved. We are on to item number 23. We do appreciate everybody coming down. See you. Patrick, you up? You ready? All right. Next item, oh, yep. Next item on this evening's agenda is item 23. This is a request for final plat approval to create two lots. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. The parcel is located at 1903 Baker Road, located 2,390 feet west of Old Springfield Pike. The site is currently zoned AR2A, which requires a minimum lot size of two acres and is intended for uses that generally occur in rural areas. 
The policy for the site is conservation and T2 rural maintenance. In this instance, conservation policy identifies a portion of floodplain in the lower right-hand portion of the site. The T2 rural maintenance policy is intended to maintain the rural character as a permanent choice for living within Davidson County and is not intended to be a holding or a transi transitional zone for future urban development. This image illustrates the proposed plat and the request to create the two lots on the property. Lot one, as shown, contains a single family home and lot two is currently vacant. When a parcel is proposed to be subdivided, is located within a T2 rural maintenance land use policy, we apply the rural character subdivision regulations to review the proposed subdivision. Section 425 of the subdivision regulations establishes criteria for reviewing the subdivision of land in rural neighborhood policies to ensure that new development is in harmony with the established rural character of these areas. The plat was reviewed against the open alternative requirements as these requirements are the most appropriate for the plat as proposed. This aerial image shows the location of the site relative to the surrounding parcels and the subject property is highlighted in red. Building setback. The required building setback shall be varied between lots and where the minimum required street setback is less than the average of the street setback of the two parcels abutting either side of the lot proposed to be subdivided, a minimum building setback line shall be included on the proposed lots at the average setback of these abutting parcels. In this instance, neither lot one nor lot two meets the required setback of 480 feet. Lot depth. The minimum lot, minimum lot depth for lots along existing public streets shall be the building setback required by section 425A1 plus 300 feet. For the proposed subdivision, a depth of 780 feet is required. Lot one with a depth of 419 feet and lot two with a depth of 453 feet does not meet the minimum depth requirement for the lots of 780 feet. Lot size. As previously mentioned in our other subdivision proposal, we apply um, subdivision regulations which require that the lots be either equal to or greater than 70% of the lot size of the average size of the surrounding parcels or equal to or larger than the smallest of the surrounding parcel parcels, whichever is greater. Based on the surrounding lots as defined by the subdivision regulations, the minimum required lot size is 10.09 acres for each lot. As proposed, lot one will contain 2.67 acres and lot two is proposed to contain 2.33 acres. And therefore, neither lot meets the minimum lot area requirement. Lot frontage. We apply the same subdivision regulations as we do for area, and based on the surrounding lots as defined by the subdivision regulations, the minimum lot width is 327 feet. Lot one with a proposed frontage of 243 feet, and lot two with a proposed frontage of 237 feet does not meet the minimum requirement for lot frontage. This aerial image shows the surrounding parcels outlined in red and the subject site proposed to be subdivided, highlighted in orange. Agency review. The rural subdivision regula regulations require the approval of the Metro Health Department as the plat has identified new septic fields for lot two. The plat as proposed has not been approved by the Metro Health Department. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to disapprove the plat as proposed as the subdivision does not meet the minimum requirements of the rural subdivision regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up, sir. Hold on one second. You'll have 10 minutes, and then uh, you can reserve two minutes for the rebuttal, and then you got to turn on the button. The red light will come on. Yeah, right. state your name and your address. Okay. Ben Davidson, 257 uh, Lake Terrace Drive, uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Uh, Carl had a family emergency. I'm going to speak on his behalf. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Carl purchased the property in 2016, five acres, uh, with, a, with the uh, in mind that he and I would split when it came time, two and a half and two and a half. Uh, went down to Metro Coach for hours, 
And we learned that it was zoned AR2A. I've never really heard of an overlay until about a month ago when the surveyor brought it about. Um, but I just, it's zoned AR2A and the overlay is T2RM still says two acres. And I mean, a lot of the houses around the area are not set back uh, the 700 feet and all that. I just, we're just two working people trying to provide a home for our family. Thank you. Thank you for coming down, sir. Appreciate it. And we'll reserve two minutes uh, for your rebuttal. Anyone in the room wishing to speak in support? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, you know, yeah. Seeing none, we'll close the public. I declare the public hearing closed. And how about uh, um, Commissioner no, Tim, um, do you want to go first? No comment. You haven't gone first yet. I think so, but it's Oh, okay. you did? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, oh, well, uh, then I'm, I'm messing up. That's okay. Okay. It's, it's hard to keep up with all, all right. that. Um, no comment. I, I, I agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Bichel. I want to hear everybody else first. Okay. That's fair. Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Gobble. No, I have to agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Sims. No question. Commissioner Haynes. I'll move approval of staff's recommendation to disapprove. That's a proper motion, unless okay. Commissioner Bichel wants to speak. That's a proper motion. Second. And a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the staff recommendation to disapprove, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and this item is disapproved. We are on to other business under item H. Historic. Commissioner Tibbs. Nothing but our next, but our next meeting is at the parks board. <clears throat> okay. Parks. Commissioner Haynes. No report. Executive Committee, I have a long two-hour report for Mr. Haynes. Uh, I, I go Preds, but I do have to say we have some important matters uh, uh, coming up, and so I do need to just cover a few things for the Executive Committee. And so um, as far as our executive search uh, goes, um, I want to thank everybody that's been involved and all of the commissioners um, for talking to HR. The interview panel we met on Friday, April 27th and Thursday, May 3rd. The panel included Council Lady Berkeley Allen, Civic Design Center uh, CEO Gary um, Gaston, MDHA Representative Stuart Clifton, former councilman and commissioner, Monique Odom, Parks Director, Metro Chief um, Strategy Officer um, Brian Kelsey, and then myself. We had, we looked at five candidates. We approved um, three, we recommended approval for three candidates to come before this commission. Uh, Kelly has sent out information on uh, trying to schedule several meetings. You guys are very busy. Uh, so it looked like we could meet, except uh, for Commissioner Gobble, uh, at one o'clock uh, on Thursday, May 24th, is that right, Kelly? I think that's what we, we said. So we're, we're in process of calling that special meeting at one o'clock. The process will be, in loose terms, will be we have three hours, an hour for each candidate. The, um, my intention, if it's okay with the commission, is to have each one of those particular candidates um, talk about themselves for about 10, 15 minutes have like two or three questions, uh, like canned questions like, why do you think your qualifications um, make you the app, you know, the, the appropriate person to take this position, stuff like that. So two or three, and then we'll open it up to questions for the commissioners. So be thinking of questions, and then we'll have HR give us a little pre-HR um, meeting so that we don't ask things we're not supposed to in an HR setting. So. Um, those of you who are involved in HR know what to ask, but we'll give a little, uh, you know, you can't ask certain personal things by law. And our lawyer knows that, and he'll keep us straight. All right. All right. Uh, HR will be there too, um, and so um, th that is the intention. I feel really good. Um, 
about the quality of candidates. Um, several of you know those particular candidates, and then we'll have um, HR. I, I can't remember if we've sent out each one of those candidates information and packet. Did, did, did we do that? Yes. Okay. So you all know who the candidates are. And I, I think the panel did really good. And then I also want to thank the, the expert panel, which Mr. Haynes served on and several other, including Rick Bernhardt. Um, and so I feel good about the, the diversity of the panels, the amount of thought and effort that has went into this. Um, and so I just want to thank everybody involved. I feel um, like the process has gone as smoothly as an HR hiring executive director can go. So um, that's my report on that. If there, but are there any questions for that? I look forward to working with you all on the 24th. Um, I have... Um, and then we'll roll into our normal. So the, uh, to, to be, uh, also I want to warn you, it is a public meeting. We, we, because of the Sunshine Law, we cannot have, the only time we have an executive committee meeting is, a closed door meeting is on a legal, pending legal case. That's the only time we can meet uh, not, uh, not in public. So um, be thinking of that um, as, when we do the the, pan, the interviews. So, um, any questions? Commissioner Sims, yes. I wanted to make a comment about something else. <clears throat> I would like to invite you to come here, Lee Jones, and I to present. We're going to be talking to a whole group of neighborhood people on Saturday, May the 19th, about soliciting input on how neighborhood, how we can work better with neighborhoods as a planning commission. That is wonderful. I am so glad y'all are doing that. Can we earn? Credit for that if we go with 10? Can we earn it? Well, it's $10 for breakfast, I think. So. Oh, 10 bucks. Okay. <laughs> We're worth it. They're worth it. Mr. Sims is worth it. Every penny. Anything else on any other questions? All right. Bob, do you have anything? Um, we had our budget hearing last night at council, and that went, I think, fairly smoothly. And we have a, the mayor's budget is a status quo budget for this next year. And um, so we're, the, the council is now going to be moving through that process to uh, look at the mayor's budget, and we'll see how that ends up. And um, we're back at the Sunny West Auditorium on May 24th for our regular meeting. All right, and that concludes all of our, my business. Any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? We're adjourned. This is for a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.